weren't getting luxury airliner flight between Indianapolis and Chicago. No, but they, they, would, they would fly us in. We'd fly into wherever we had to do the first show and fly out from the second show, whatever time it was in. So you'd fly into Indianapolis, uh, Michigan, leave from Indianapolis. Right. right. How about the crowds as you started to go west? I mean, were they bloodthirsty ECW fans yeah. like Philly or no? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, they, they expected for your head to pop off and a spaceship to fly out. You know what I mean? Because they saw ECW and they wanted what they saw on TV. Right. So we had to give it to them. They weren't selling for less. We had to go out there, and, and we, we would have to go out there and do it. Maybe even more so than the Philly fans, because the Philly fans were used to it now. Yeah, they were, so they were already used to it. But when we, when we started heading Midwest to West, dude, they wanted to see it all. There is a rumor. It is said that on ECW, on long road trips, only the oldest person in the car was allowed to nap. Did you ever hear any of that? That's not true. All right, we, yeah. hear, we hear these things. We no, that's things. not true. <laughs> Nobody will sleep. Everybody was doing drugs in the car. Oh. <laughs> Come on now. Me and Sandman, Tommy Rich, Bill Alfonso. Oh, yeah. Okay, out of the old, it's going to be Bill Alfonso. Out of the four I just named, who was trying to go to sleep? Nobody. Right. So that's far from the truth. Whose idea is this to have an NWA angle? Okay. The truth. We tell the truth here, right? I can handle the truth. The truth is, at that time, the booking committee, committee consisted of myself, Vince McMahon, and Jim Cornette. This was the early movement of the Attitude Era. And in those uh, creative booking sessions, myself and Vince McMahon were going one way, which was really the start of the Attitude Era. Uh, Jim Cornette was, was um, still in his roots, you know, still the old traditional school wrestling. So to be honest with you, there were a couple of things going through my mind at this time, and I'm shooting straight and being totally honest. Number one, I really wanted to make Jim happy. And I knew if we did an NWA, NWA angle with Jarrett and... Um, uh, Wyndham and rock and roll, I knew Jim would be in all his glory. I knew that would make him happy. However, I had an ulterior motive, and I'm going to be completely honest. I knew it wasn't going to work. So with me, it would have killed two birds with one stone. It would have made Jim happy. It would have appeased Jim. It, and, and it was my way of showing Jim, I'm happy to try this. We can do this. But I'm telling you, it's 1998 and this is not going to work. Because in my mind, if Jim saw the crowd response with the angle and that old school style traditional wrestling and he saw it and heard it with his own ears, then maybe he would kind of understand uh, you know, more or less where I was coming from and where Vince was coming from at the time. So it, it was designed for a reason, and those were really the two reasons. Well, what's the resultant discussion with Jim when it doesn't go over? Well, I, you know, J Jim's, he, you know, he, he's just the kind of guy that he would not admit to it not going over. And he would also believe in his heart of hearts. He would honestly believe that in time it would have gotten over. But, you know, again, it's, it's nothing against Jim. It's nothing against that style of wrestling. Let, let's face it. You know, the, the wrestling business got to that point based on that type of wrestling. And greats like the Rock and Roll Express, the Midnight Express, Barry Windham, greats, greats like that. But this was a different time. And, um, you know, it, 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 it just was not going to work in 1998. Um, is this something that now Vince McMahon is, is 
is willing to go along with for the same reasons you are, or is he just kind of saying, oh, look, you two guys work it out? How involved is he in saying, okay, let's do an NWA thing? That's a, that, that, that's a good question. I mean, he, he, he didn't fight it. You okay. know, and, and I think he was kind of on the same wavelength I was. We wanted to show Jim the proper respect, but we really had to take him, you know, dragging, kicking, screaming, punching, you know, into, you know, the year 2000. So I, I think Vince, Vince was looking at it the same exact way I was where, listen, we're not, we're not going to sit here and argue with you. This style is not going to work in 1998, and we're willing to show you it's not going to work. What a man. Nicole. What was your initial reaction to seeing Nicole come in for the first time? Nicole didn't like me from jump. Because I asked Nicole, I said, Nicole, can I see your dick? Yes. <laughs> right away. <laughs> Off the bat. Off the bat. <laughs> so Nicole didn't like me from jump. It was like no hold. <laughs> you must have been over with the boys, though. With... <laughs> Did she fit in the locker room? No. Yeah. No. Nobody liked her. Because she thought that she, her muscles, she thought her muscles spoke. You know what I mean? It was like, you know, she had all of that with no knowledge of, you know, no, no knowledge of, you know, to how to work right. or whatever, you know, to be a heel or face, whatever. Didn't have a clue. So nobody liked her. So she didn't get the wrestling part of no. what she was being asked to do. Kind of stupid. I mean, to let somebody tape your head shut, yeah, it's kind of stupid. To ask, I mean, if you ask me. This is from a cane shot from Sandman. Sandman suffer any repercussions for people he may have hurt being irresponsible with his cane. I'll tell you something about Sandman. Sandman will get drunk and go out in the ring and beat people to death with a stick. And he would always think it, Jack, they, they look great, then I, I took care of my guy. I see he had killed him, you know? And nobody would say anything to him. Paulie? Paulie? Paulie didn't care, Paulie didn't care. It would look good for TV. You know, his ratings as far as Paulie concerned. But Sam, man, he would beat, he'd beat you to death with a stick. If you didn't say anything to him, he wouldn't. He wouldn't stop. Right. He hit me one time in my head, and I swear I felt like that stick wrapped around my head. And I took a chair and hit Sam. Man, I tried to kill him with it. And we got in the back. He was like, "Jack, did I hit you too hard?" I said, "Did I hit you hard?" He was like, "Yeah, yeah, it was kind of stiff." I said, "Well, yeah, that, that stick was kind of stiff." You know what I mean? And then he was like, "He he he did apologize to me." You know what I mean? But he was known for doing that. He lose control because of yeah, because he was drunk. Right. I know what happened. Okay. We were outside. Bunch of us outside, and these girls were walking into this bar next door to the arena, upstairs. Tammy called the girl fat, and the girl had on this dress that was fitting like real nice. I don't know if she was a threat to Tammy or what, but Tammy called her fat, and the girl called Tammy a name back. They started having words, then these guys jumped in. One of the guys went over and pushed Chris. Sabu did the run in. Mm -hmm. Other guys did the run in. Me and Devon did the run in. So one big cluster right out in the parking lot.
Chris huddled over. He's hovering over Tammy. Keep her from getting stomped. That's what happened. Uh, how often did this kind of stuff happen after ECW shows where <sighs> fan, I don't even want to say fans because these weren't these were people at the bar next door. Yeah, right? they, so, they those weren't fans at all. But uh, it happened quite a few times. They get that courage juice in them, right. <laughs> you know. And you guys never were looking to get involved, and in, you know you're minding your business and all the <coughs> exactly. opportunity. To jump in, you all best off. Right. Um, th again, I'm going to go back to Paulie. A any fallout from this? Like, is Paulie does he crack the whip ever and say, you know, because you guys are a product. Paulie put the heat on Score that night. That's night he came back right from WWE, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The heat got put on Score because Score was involved in it. But he didn't get involved until he saw other people getting involved. All right. I was more involved than Squirt was, but Squirt was out there. He was swinging for the fence, too. The word got back to Vince about what had happened. Party put the heel on Squirt. Which is brilliant because it's not his guy. That's Vince's guy. Right. It's fantastic. <laughs> Pulley. <laughs>
there were many people that believed, you know, Sean was, um, you know, Sean was working it. There was, there was, you know, nuclear. I, I just started a new column, nuclear heat. That's my new thing. So somebody said that I had nuclear heat with TNA, so I stole the nuclear heat. But there was nuclear heat at the time between Sean and Vince. The reason why I know that is because I was the liaison right smack in the middle. Vince was not talking to Sean. Sean was not talking to Vince. Sean would tell me what to tell Vince. I'd go tell Vince. Vince would tell me what to go tell Sean. So I was smack in the middle of it. But I have to say this, and, and I was there to witness all this, and, um, and I didn't appreciate it. And I mean, I, I've seen it numerous times since. In my opinion, if you go back to pre-attitude years, I'm talking about 95, I'm talking about, you know, the goon and, and T.L. Hopper right, and right. all those guys, okay? If you go back pre-attitude, there was one guy that was literally carrying the company on his back while, while, while the company was desperately holding on, and that was Shawn Michaels. You know, he was the champion. I can remember the programs with Vader, and I can, I can clearly remember Sean was a company guy when he was the champion prior to the Attitude Era. Whatever the company wanted, Sean did. I can tell you that firsthand. I was there. When Austin came along and Austin started getting hot, mm -hmm. I literally could see Vince McMahon kick Sean to the curb like yesterday's news. It's time to go with the hot new toy. And that, in my opinion, that's what Vince was doing. And, and that, that's what triggered Sean's anger. And, and my opinion, I think he had every right in the world to be upset. How does a Vince McMahon kick a talent to the curb? Is it less TV time? Is it losses on television? Like, what is attention, that kicking to? Attention. Attention. Just the personal attention. attention. Pers personal attention. Back in the locker room. I, I remember when the, the day Steve Austin won the WWE title for the first time, Vince McMahon at, at the, the, the next TV said to me, Vince, Steve is your number one priority. Nobody else matters. You're to be with him, you know, 24-7, 24 hours a day. You know, he is the guy. So it was really just personal attention, whereas when Vince needed Sean, you know, prior to the Attitude Era, you know, Sean was the guy. All of a sudden now he's got this new guy that's on fire and all of his personal attention is going to, to, to Steve. And I think Sean took that personally and quite honestly, I, I didn't blame him. I saw it with my own two eyes. How's the deal made to get Tyson? I mean, where does this begin? Uh, how do you get him before the competition does? This was 100% the genius of Vince McMahon. You got to remember at the time, uh, Tyson was barred from boxing because of the, the Holyfield situation. In Vince's strategy was they will pay to see Mike Tyson on pay-per-view. If they can't see him in the boxing arena, they will pay to see him in a wrestling ring. Yeah. And he was absolutely dead on. And I mean, I don't know how much Vince spent for him. I'm sure it was a pretty penny, but I tell everybody this who asked me. This was the official start of the Attitude Era. Without Tyson uh, and, and without Vince you know, making that decision, I don't know if things would have folded out the way they did. Now, I'll tell you this, too, and a lot of people don't know this. I think at the time, Vince had ulterior motives, because if you ask me, I think Vince was interested in managing the career of Mike Tyson. When he went back to boxing. Yes, because Shane was with Tyson 24-7. So I think with the situation that Tyson was in at the time with boxing, I think in Vince's mind, the, the wheels were turning. Not only would, would this be a great coup for the WWE, but maybe once Tyson sees what I did for him here and what I did for his, uh, uh, you know, I mean, he was getting bad press at the time, mm -hmm. but what, you know, what, what I did for his PR here, maybe I could take this for the next, to the next level. And, and I, I believe that was an ulterior motive of Vince. And like I said, um, that belief comes from, you know, 
Shane was with Tyson like 24-7. So I, I think there was a little bit more going on there than me. Marketing wise, it was a good thing. Because I mean they were over with the fans. Mm -hmm. They were they were they were really over. I didn't pay it no attention. Was that generally the, the case though <clears throat> in the locker room where guys were worried about their spot, worried about their shit? And maybe specific to ECW, weren't really concerned with what other guys were doing out on the ring unless they were involved. Mainly, yeah. The the whole thing with Shane, Bam. Chris, we never, we were supposed to work one time, but we didn't. So I didn't really care about it. But like I said, it was over with the fans. Right. Well, Paulie and Dreamer were boys. Okay. And I mean, I, 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 I'll admit, a lot of times Paulie, if he came up with an idea, he wouldn't force it on you. He would run it by you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. To see, okay, what do you think, what if we do this or what, you know, you think it'll draw, you think it'd be good for business, whatever, whatever. That he ran by Dreamer. Dreamer agreed to it. Okay, so, I personally wouldn't have done it. You know what I mean? I mean, th there's a line. You know, you, you have to draw a line. I wouldn't have done it. But Dream and Paulie were boys. I mean, even though Dreamer might say, okay, there's family members and cousins and right. other people affected, so. Right. He could have. Right. But Dream was just like Paulie. Right. What, what, what's going to work? Give them something they want to see. You know what I mean? And they, they, they both thought alike when it came to that. Did you ever turn down stuff like that where they asked you to get a little too personal with, with another worker? <laughs> no. The only thing I did one time that it, 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 it was hard to do was cry. Paulie wanted me, Paulie wanted me to, to cut a promo and wanted me to cry during the promo and I couldn't cry. <laughs> so, so he sent some, one of the guys down to the grocery store and he bought some onions. So we, we cut the onions, <laughs> we cut the onions and put them in a little bowl. And I had them sitting right up under the <laughs> tape. What was the context that he wanted you to cry? We had just got the straps, I think. My nephew has supposedly died, got shot, got shot and killed. Uh -huh. So he, and I told him, I said, yeah, I said, I'll do it, you know. I saw it. So my nephew got shot and killed. So I promised my nephew that we would win the belts. All right. <laughs> so, so, and I was like, I'm going to bring the belt home. We're getting the belts. But he wanted me to cry. And I couldn't make myself cry. I just naturally knew it. I couldn't do it. See y'all. That was my idea because um, I remember during the week, like USA was starting to have some problems. So I was like, you know what, Let, let's use this to our advantage. And um, I got to tell you, that was, I, I think that was, one of the, uh, that was one of the better moments of the Attitude Era. Was, uh, is this something Vince is on board for right away or do you need to cajole him a little? 100% on board. Does he have the same vision you have for the way the company has to go, or did he need a little bit of convincing, big picture wise? Well, see, that, that's tough to say because no, no matter what I say, nobody believes. Vince really did. If you know Vince McMahon, you cannot give him a white piece of paper and he's going to write you a wrestling show. Right. He can't do that. That's, that's just not one of his gifts. He's not capable of doing that. 
how it worked literally was I would write, you know, the entire show and hand it to Vince. This is where I always say, and I give him all the credit in the world, and, and you know, like I said, my detractors out there, it doesn't matter what I say, they don't want to believe it. This is the genius of Vince McMahon, and I've said this a million times before. I would write a show with my blood, my sweat, my tears, dotting my I's, crossing my T's, because I'm writing the show, and, and while I'm writing it, I'm saying to myself, I can't, I, I can't leave any holes in this show because Vince will find the holes. So I have to sit here and write a flawless show before I presented it to him. So I would put all my energy, the hours, the days into the show, I would finally hand it to him. Now Vince would take the finished product, he would go through the entire format and he had a way, and he used to call it the nuances. He had a way of picking out like just little things of every, in, in every segment, making a little tweak to mm -hmm. it. And if it were a seven, it were now a 10. And I used, to, I used to sit there like so frustrated, like why didn't I see that? It, it got to almost be like a competition because I wanted to write a show where he couldn't change anything. But you know, I, I realized the genius of Vince was when, when you handed him a show, he saw things that other people didn't see. You know, with, with, with his experience in the business and his dad before him, he just saw things that the average writer would not see. And, but, and that was a genius to me. But no human being can bat a thousand. So there must have been things that he came back to you with, of course, that were great, but then other ones where you went, oh, no, I don't think you get what I'm doing here. Were you able to voice your displeasure in his changes? He never changed it. I mean, pe people... Or suggestions, what, 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 whatever pe the vernacular pe is. People find that, like, so hard to believe in. Listen, man, F Ferrara's out there. Like, anybody could ask Ed Ferrara. Vince really didn't change the show. I mean, he never said, no, we're not going to have this match. No way going in this direction. He never did that. What he would do, I, I, I think he understood the effort that Ed and I were putting into the show. I think Vince knew that. Keep in mind... The ratings are climbing this whole time. So Vince was smart enough to, I'm not going to screw with something that's right. working. So th that's why I say, you know, he, now he took our shows and, you know, he used the, the tweaks here and there to make it the best that it could be. But a as far as rewrites or, you know, just Xing things out, that just rarely happened. First of all, why the Chainsaw Charlie gimmick and not Terry Fong? This is just another great story. Okay. Cornette was pushing to bring Terry Funk back because Jim Cornette loves Terry Funk, as we all do. Mm -hmm. I love Terry Funk, mm -hmm. man. I'm as a matter of fact, in this show, I had to look it up. He does a moonsault. Not, not this one. It might have been the one before, but he did a moonsault off the top. I had to look it up. He was 54 years yeah, old at yeah. the time. And I was like, that's incredible. Yeah. So everybody loves Terry yeah. Funk. Okay, so Jim Cornette want, was trying to get Terry Funk on the show. Listening to the conversation, I think there was some heat back in the history of Vince McMahon and Terry Funk. The, it, whether it was overpay, because okay. remember the Double Cross Ranch and yeah, all that. He did his run here. There was yeah. something there where like Vince didn't like jump at the chance to bring him in, right? So I remember Jim pitching, and this, this, is, a, um, this is a perfect example of um, where Vince and I was headed and where Jim was. And listen, I don't say this to rip Jim. If Jim were here, this, this is the story. Me and Vince are right in the Attitude Era. You know, Jim's still doing his Memphis stuff. And he wanted to bring in Terry Funk. So he suggested the idea of putting Terry Funk in a box and leaving him ringside the entire show. And people are wondering, you know, what's in the box, what's in the box. And, and I, I remember this like it was just a, because you don't forget a quote like this. And this isn't like to poke fun. This is one of the greatest quotes of all time. Jim, Jim sat there and told me and Vince, anybody who comes out of a box is instantly over. 
And like we just had to, I mean, that's priceless. I mean, that, if I could make that up, I should be a Hollywood writer right now. So Vince took that. And for some reason, I think he wanted to take away from Jim that we're going to use Terry Funk. And I think, like I said, there may have been a back history where there was a little heat with Terry Funk. So Vince came up with the idea of, okay, we'll put him in a box, but it's not going to be Terry Funk that comes out. It's going to be Chainsaw Charlie. Now, Cornette, like, was, like, he could not even believe, like, did this, Terry Funk is Jesus to Cornette, so he couldn't even believe Vince was suggesting this. I'm sitting there, like, realizing, like, I think this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life, Chainsaw Charlie, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm also picking up the vibes from Vince and the stuff that he's saying that there's more here than meets the eye. You know, remember, remember back in the day when Vince made Dusty come out in the yellow polka dots? Sure, of course. It, it, to me, it was like that kind of a moment. Right. So, like, I really didn't say anything. Thus, Chainsaw Charlie. And Vince comes up with the name. He has the name Chainsaw Charlie ready and all that. Yes. Yes. And Terry goes along with it. Well, if you notice, because I noticed this when I went back and watched, Terry goes along with it. But if you notice, during one of the live shows, at some point, Terry lifts up the stocking to show everybody it's him, and then he pulls it right back down. So it's like Vince was trying to get over on Terry, and Terry the professional was saying, you're not going to get over on me. Those are the little things like that. If you go back and you look at, like you see these little things, and they just, they mean a lot more today. The bump into the dumpster. What's mm. in the dumpster? I got to tell you this, too. I'll tell you a couple of things. Well, for, first of all, if you look at it closely, because I just looked at it the other day, you could see it's lined with, like, black uh, plastic garbage bags. That's because underneath it on all sides and the bottom was protection. Right, right. Okay? But I could tell you this. This is another thing I remember. Um, very rarely would Vince really, like, work with a talent. You know, like, I, I, I did a lot of that. I did a producing. This was a segment, if you go back and you look at these shows, um, the New Age Outlaws were like just starting to get over, okay? And this was one of the segments, uh, th this one and I believe the following week, Vince was really hands-on with Billy and Road Dog. He was out there producing this himself. And I think part of that too was, and again, I'm, w w when I'm wrong, like I'll say I'm wrong, when we were talking about, you know, DX and everything, we were forming DX together, you know, the idea was the NWO was kicking our backside at the time. Vince turned around and said to me, he goes, I don't understand it. He goes, we have the talent here and they're a lot younger. Okay? So we already had China, um, Hunter, and Deshaun as DX. And, you know, Vince said we need to, like, expand that group. And he came up with the idea of the New Age Outlaws. And he said, um, you know, Billy Gunn mm -hmm. and Road Dogg, Jesse James. And I got to be honest, I looked at him and I'm like, Vince, they were not over. Like, those guys were not mm -hmm. over. And I said, Vince, I don't, I just, I don't see that. I mean, you're talking about Hunter and Sean and China. And, you know, these guys were Rockabilly, the Roadie. I, I, I don't see that combination. But he goes, no, no, he, 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 he saw it and he believed in it. And I, I think it was the fact that, like, I kind of told him I, I didn't think it would work, that he, I, I mean, he kind of made this his own. And he started producing those guys. It, it, I, I think this was the most that I ever saw Vince work with anybody. He really started producing Billy. He really started producing Road Dogg. So he had a lot of involvement in those scenes. Okay. Were you invited to that wedding? No. Was any, any of the workers? No. Now, this is after he left. He left in 97. So how was he still looked at by the guys? Favorably? Todd didn't leave. Well, right. Todd has Todd been gone. Todd booted out right. the door. Paul Lee got put in a position of power. They didn't develop this company called Extreme. He was East Coast. Eastern. Eastern Championship. Eastern Championship. Whatever. Paul Lee gets a hold, a hold of it. 
he gets all these connections. He gets his TV deal. He comes to Todd and he says to Todd, you either let me do it my way or I'll take your talent. We'll name it something else and we'll leave you with nothing. I'll pay you. You let me run it. Todd didn't have a choice. Todd owned the company that Paulie was at. Paulie was paying Todd his own money. So by the time he's gone in, in 90, well, 98, but he's gone in 97, is he somebody that the boys still had a fond view of? Everybody liked Todd. Everybody liked Todd. See him as a puppet. Yeah. Oh, he played the game. Oh, he played the game. Cause Paul Lee, Paul, Paul Lee put it to him. Paul Lee put it to him. But he, he, stuck, he stuck in there with it. He I saw Louis about two weeks before that. I we we had just well we had been here for a minute. Louis came in. He was at a Chinese restaurant across the street from the hotel. He was peeled up. I didn't know. And I, I watched him. He was in there eating. He was trying to eat. And he kept missing his mouth. And he had this big puddle of food on the table. And I thought he was just being funny. And I'm like, I said, Lou, what's wrong with you, man? And he gave me the, the look. And the guy named Mike, he said he'd been taking pills. And at, at the time, I was totally stupid about pills. I didn't have a clue what, you know, someone was perfect said. I, I didn't know. He opened his hand up, pulled him a handful, and just took him. With a beer. This was about three, four o'clock. We still had a show to do. He was able to kick out by the time the show started. Wow. And I told Louis that night, I saw him, I said, you know what? I said, that shit I saw you do at the at the uh restaurant, I said it's gonna be the death of you watch. And I didn't mean to I didn't I didn't say it to like put a jinx on him, but I said it to him. And then I found out a couple weeks later he died from that. And they said that he had like 30 some undigested pills in his system. Now they, they, they talk about the ones that they found. Right, how many were taken before that? Right, yeah. right. You know, and everybody was hit by it. Was it in, in any way a wake-up call for other people? Now, you said you hadn't been introduced to pills yet, but you were, you were, well, Coke was your thing, right? Huh? Coke? Yeah. That was your thing a little yeah. bit, right? I was doing so Coke. So were you able to, like, even just looking at that, did it, did it make you think twice about any choices or any of the other guys? No. No. <laughs> no. I was like, that's fucked up. <laughs> 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 I hate it. But, but no, it, it didn't make me stop. It made me, yeah. oh, man, I'm, I've been not, no. Because you can overdose on that as easily right. as you can. Pills. Easier, right. You know what I mean? But you were cutting lines on the casket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's one for you, big baby. You know, so. Was he liked by everyone in ECW? Yeah. yeah. Lil was cool. What was their relationship like? Were they faithful to each other? Who? Tammy and Chris. Chris was faithful. Tammy wasn't faithful to no. <laughs> Hell no. I love her to death, but Tammy wasn't faithful. Even this far back? Because, no, you know, we know the, the Shawn Michaels stuff and everything that happened later in WWE. 
but this far back in ECW. Tammy would turn the tricks for someone was no, Tammy wasn't faithful, man. No. Yeah, I mean Sabu and Sandman have had some interesting stories, which we played for Tammy on air. Not telling tales out of school. She said they're all crazy. They're not crazy? No. Japanese guys, the, the, the language barrier, did they, it make it difficult in the ring? With these well, see, guys? a lot of times they, they say they can't speak English and they can. Oh, I've heard that. You know what I mean? They play that game. Uh, what's, Tajiri was good for that because Tajiri didn't speak English. But he was good for, no, 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 nah, like, yes, you can, motherfucker. You, yes, you can. But no, he, Tajiri was good for that. But uh, they, they all do it. Jenna Jameson. If, if I describe it, it would be silly. Blonde, big tits, porn star. That narrows it down, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, I'm just... <laughs> no. Is there jealousy among other women in the locker room when you get a woman like that from the outside that comes in who's... Of course. ...put together and... Of course, because they feel like she ain't paid no dues. And no Probably. crazy stories having a major porn star backstage at an ECW show? The boys aren't going crazy? No. Okay. I mean, honestly, bro, we, we, didn't, we didn't give a shit. You know, if they brought somebody in from outside, didn't anybody care. Worst thing we have, I might walk through the locker room naked. Just for the hell of it. You might, you mean? Yeah, I would oh. do it. Just, just, just because I thought it was funny. Somebody would be sitting over there, somebody brought their wife or their girlfriend in the back, and I'd walk right by them, butt naked, just... How you doing? And Paulie, Don't belong here. <laughs> yeah, and Paulie was he started laughing. First of all, how's that gimmicked when that's got to happen? They just literally cut out the wood in the. They, you know when you when you're building the ring, yeah. at the end it's got plywood that goes over the planks. Mm -hmm. Got the planks, then it's got the flat plywood that goes over top. Right. They leave that piece out, and if you notice, all the matches before their match, nobody went in that area, and everybody knew. You know, it was like, man, y'all know don't go in that corner because there's nothing there. So they worked around it, the whole show, right. until it was time, and then they fell through. When it came time for, uh, when it came time for Taz to lose a belt to a job, was he someone that was difficult, put up a stink? I never worked Taz, and I told Paulie I wasn't working. Because I wouldn't put him over. And I knew if I worked him, I would have to put him over. Why wouldn't you put him over? Because I knew Taz before Taz turned orange. Okay, when Taz was a little fat white boy working for Johnny Ross, Taz quit. Johnny Ross told me a story. He's, he's a new Jack. He said, Taz quit every week for two months. And I saw a picture with Taz, Tommy Dreamer, the other guys. Taz was a little white boy, a little pudgy, fat white boy with a little afro. And he wasn't orange yet. And Paul Lee started giving him a push. And then it just started going to his head. Well, then he started doing the thing, the Mike Tyson thing. That, that used to just drive me to see him twitch his neck like Tyson, he would do that. He's a big Tyson mark. So he's not a legit badass? No. No. I went out of Taz one time. The night I hit 
dancing with Dudley in the head with a stick. And Taz tried to stand up for him. And I went out to Taz. And Taz ran. That's when I knew Taz was a punk. The night I saw Van Dan slap Taz upside the head, we did a pay per view in New Orleans. It was Sabu, Van Dam, and Taz in the match. Something happened during the match that didn't go right. After the match was over with, Taz ran in the back. And he acting like he was looking for Van Dam and Sabu because he's supposed to be pissed off. Well, Van Dam found out afterwards. So the next week in New York, Van Dam comes in. He sees Taz. He says, Taz, pick a hand. He said, huh? He says, pick a hand. He said, what you mean? And he slapped him. Then he slapped him again. That's when everybody knew Taz was a work. He was like, dude, not in front of my students. I told Rob, I said, you know that karate and all that shit. I said, that's all well and good. I said, but you ain't got but one time to slap me. And I said, we going at it. And nobody had what little respect they had for Taz. After that, it was gone. Across the locker room, you would say? Yeah. Some people knew, some wasn't sure. After that night, everybody was sure. Would they do something like that? Would they pre-tape it so that they could make sure they had a good match before it aired? It's possible. Yeah. If Paul Lee behind anything possible. Uh, there was a match just prior to this that uh, Sam, and he admitted it on our show, it was tripping on acid, and he was calling uh, Sabu a lizard the, the, the whole night, and he was seeing a lizard instead of no. Sabu. No. <laughs> lizard, lizard, no. lizard. We was in Pittsburgh. Me and Sandman was doing acid. Yeah. I had never done it. So somebody like, Jack, you want so these little pieces of little sheets of <laughs> little thingies. And I was like, yeah, give them. So I peeled off like five of them, put them on my tongue. So Sandman did it. And I started hearing stuff, like my hair growing and blood flowing and, and, and dude, I, the grass growing and I was tripping. And uh, Sandman kept picking at me that night and I was tripping to a point where I was crying. I was literally crying. And uh, we got in the ring during the match. Sandman gets the mic, the house mic. It goes over in the corner. Some bubble, Devon is punching him. Same man gets the mic down, here, lizard, 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 here, lizard, lizard. And I'm in the ring crying, like, oh, God, oh, God, it's a chihuahua from Taco Bell. And I'm in the ring screaming, and he did do it. Yeah. It did happen. Do you ever have a problem with him being fucked up for any of your matches where you were in danger? Or that one time he hit me across the head. Just the one time with yeah. the, the cane. Yeah. And I hit him back. We was... Cool after that. Before you would go out, do you ever have a, pr a problem? W notice somebody was in a state and you said, I'm not going, I'm not going, I can't go out here with this guy. No, that was always me. <laughs> Other guy <laughs> saying, I'm like, that was all. <laughs> I'm sitting upstairs snorting coke. I got coke all over my nose and on the side of my face. <laughs> and Paul Lee trying to tell us what they're doing. And he's just like, Paul Lee, I ain't going to do that. Paul, he called it, check. And I'm like, stop. <laughs> I'm like, stop. <laughs> yeah, that was me. How'd you come down after being so hyped like that? Because you, you, you have a little chemical assistance. Yeah. Then you're going to go out and physically exert yourself, beat the balls off of somebody with everything you can. Now you got to leave. How are you able to go to sleep at any point that night? With a mixture of that and adrenaline, Right. When it all hits you together, right. you come down. 
Really? After the show? I would, I would, I would probably be back to normal after my match. Not too long after my match. I would still be like a little wired. <laughs> By the time we left, I was fine. This is Robert Parker. Um, he doesn't make it. What? Why? Again, I think it's a transition. You know, th this, it's really cool to go back and look at the time you're talking about now because we, honestly, we're starting to feel our way into the Attitude Era. And, and I'm telling you, those numbers that we got every week dictated the direction that we were going in. So therefore, if Jarrett and, and Tennessee Lee was a low rating, like all of a sudden if we went from a three and these guys came on and we went to a two five, why would we go there the next week? That's, th that's the problem with today's, with today's wrestling. Nobody's looking at the ratings. The ratings would tell them everything they need to know. Nobody's looking at it. So nine times, that, nine times out of ten, if we're talking about a talent that doesn't fly, it's because of the numbers and the crowd. The beautiful thing about Vince, and listen, i got to tell you, I ran into this outside of Vince McMahon and Ed Ferrara. I ran into this with everybody I ever worked with when it came creative. And I'm talking from Eric Bischoff to Jim Cornette to Jerry Jarrett to anybody I ever worked with creatively. A lot of times my frustration used to come because I would sit in a room and you're hearing everybody's opinion. And I would sit there and I, and I would say, your opinion doesn't matter. My opinion doesn't matter. All we have here is the documentation of the ratings. This is all that matters. Right. And even Vince, he was not, I want to push this guy, I want to push that guy. I don't like this guy, I don't like the guy. Vince was not that way at all. The numbers were dictating, and when you look at it, that really made our jobs easy. Right. That's why today I don't understand why that's been thrown out the window. Is it known in the ECW locker room that these guys are drug dealers? Back I think then, you call it that. Back then, before I stepped on the scene, well, <laughs> the, 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 the cocaine would come from Gary and Anthony. And then when I got up there, it kind of switched over to me because I had a connection too in Philly. But you were moving in on their action. Did they take offense to that? I didn't give a shit. They might have, but they didn't say nothing. So what about the gas? The guys would go to them for the gas yeah. still? Yeah. But you became the, the go-to guy for the other stuff. Yep. Without a doubt. <laughs> Who are the other successful salesmen? <laughs> you guys had alternate careers. You were planning for your future. It's brilliant. Anyone sell vacuum cleaners? Without a doubt. Oh, my God. Who would I go to for weed, if I wanted weed? I don't know. RVD? I don't know. Todd? I, I don't know. I deal with the hard shit. I deal with the heart attack. So I, I, I have no idea. I don't know. Is she, at this point, easy to work with? Absolutely. I mean, without a doubt. Um, listen, man, I was, I was so smitten with Sable that I, I could not even look her in the eye. I thought she was the most attractive woman I had ever seen. And every, all my dealings with her, I mean, she was in absolute you know, sweetheart. I mean, I, I, I worked, you know, really, really closely with her because, oh man, this was kind of like the first diva that was starting to get over mm -hmm. and the guys really didn't like it 
it was still really the old school mentality. The guys in the locker room. The guys in the locker room. And I knew this was going on, and I knew she knew it was going on. Mark Mero, who was a great guy, was in the middle of this. Me, I hate to say it, but all I cared about was the ratings. And if Sable was drawing, whether the guys in the locker room liked it or not, I did not care. So some of what we hear about her being difficult and not easy to work with and whatnot, is it safe to assume some of that comes from guys in the locker room that were just uncomfortable with her getting over? Well, I, I, I could tell you right now, my run with her in, in the uh, Attitude Era, and she left before I did, I never had one single issue with her whatsoever. Now, I don't know if they're talking about the later years. I know she went back and spent some time mm -hmm. there. I, I, I don't okay. know that, Sable, but th there was not a single issue with her when I worked with her. But not with you, but did you witness her, you know, cuntiness? I, 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 with I witnessed else? the biggest names on the WWE roster in Vince McMahon's ear, and they did not like the fact that she was getting over. And I witnessed that. And like I said, I really didn't care because all that mattered was how many people were watching Monday night. Right. Um, how does your involvement on camera come about here? Is it just because you're working with the magazine that you present her the award? I, I, that's a good question. I, I don't remember. I mean, I, I, you know, it was, it was a blatant magazine plug. You right. know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm, we, we wrote it to plug the magazine. Right. But like my part in it wasn't really the reason for it. It was just the magazine plug and I was the editor of the magazine. This is a good point in time to talk about the magazine and uh, what your responsibilities were with WWE Magazine. I was still in charge of the magazine while all this was going on, so I had a dual role. I mean, I was, I was running two magazines, the WWE magazine and the Raw magazine, and I was writing the television with Vince. Uh, you know, with Vince. I, I, was, I was involved with the magazine and head of the magazine to the day I left. So the whole time that I was writing television, I was doing the magazine as well. Uh, your, uh, what's your staff consist of for the magazine? How many writers do you oh, have? Oh, gosh. To what, what one full time and one freelance? So you're doing everything. Every yes, I mean, there were times where I wrote every single thing in that magazine. Oh, yes. Oh, what about layout and stuff? Well, that, that we we had people you do had that. Other people but do I'm that. talking about the, the, the content. content. Yeah. I had there was a uh, there was an assistant editor and there was a uh, a freelancer and that that basically was uh -huh. it. We talked about before Vince kind of making it clear to Sean that he's got a new wrestling girlfriend. Um, are you having discussions now with Vince about how we're going to have Austin carry the company? I mean, is it explicitly said that way? It's, I, I, I'm telling you, again, based on the ratings, we wrote the television week to okay. week to week. This was all planning. We, it, we, we know where we were going pay for pay per, view, pay per view to pay per view. Okay. That was it. So we were always working towards the next pay per view. But as far as, you know, six months from now, what's Austin going to be doing? Eight months? We literally were going week by week by week, keeping our finger on those ratings. So you were totally flexible that if there was a shift in crowd uh, uh, sentiment, you could follow that Absolutely. with the writing. Absolutely. Um, the story goes that The Undertaker pulls Shawn Michael aside before this match and tells him not to cause any problems in the ring. And he's saying this while he's taping up his fists. Uh, to assure that Michaels gets the message and there's no issues. Do you ever hear anything about this? I, I've heard that, but I mean, I don't know if that's okay. true. And I, I did not see that. I did not witness that, but I've heard it. What's the reaction when Sean leaves? Um, are there some that are happy to see him go? At that point, yes. And, and I think Sean would be the first one to tell you, I, I would have been happy to see me go. He, he, he was not the Sean Michaels he is today. Uh, he was under the influence of a lot of things. Uh, he was in a foul mood because of the way Vince was treating him. I, I think Sean would have been happy to see Sean go. This show is hugely successful uh, from a financial standpoint, everything. Um, is this immediately apparent in the company? Um, is there jubilation that that you guys did it with there, WrestleMania, there, or there, does there, that take a while to... There was never 
time for jubilation. P people think I, I'm, I'm kidding. Like, we never stop to smell the roses because there was always next week's show. So you could not stop for a minute. It was a runaway train. One thing I want to tell you about the, uh, the, the WrestleMania match um, that was always interesting to me. Um, because remember, Sean went into the match with a uh, severe back injury. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember after the match, Sean laid out on the floor in the locker room and his parents were over him. And I mean, he was really selling the back, selling the back, selling the back. I witnessed that. The, the thing that always puzzled me, and yeah, I, I don't know if Sean would come clean now if asked. I bet you he would. But the one thing that always interests me was I never knew is Sean really hurt? Is mm -hmm. Sean work? Is Sean a little hurt? You know, I never really knew. But I'll never forget, watching that match, there was one specific spot in the match where Sean kipped up. And I watched that and I said, there is no way in the world. But then again, the other side of me was like, well, listen, if your adrenaline is going 100 miles an hour in front of a sold out WrestleMania crowd, but I'll never forget watching and seeing that kip, kip up, and I was like, there's no right. way. But uh, again, you know, that was just one thing I really, I always remembered about that. Why? Man, we were, this has a lot to do with it. Sable was getting over huge. I, I swear to God, Sable, I, I, I remember the specific point in time, okay? It was just an ordinary show. Sable was like nobody on the show not doing anything. She came out, and I'll never forget it, she was, she was um, like selling a big oversized um, uh, plastic chair. I mean, she was like, it was like a QVC spot. She was selling this chair on the stage. I'll never forget it because I was in the arena. The, the chair was on the stage. She came out. I swear to you, she got the second biggest pop of the night behind Austin. That's when I went back to Vince and I was like, I don't care who likes it and who doesn't. The response she's getting is unbelievable. At that point, you know, we start giving her more and more and more t -t -t Sonny was so jealous of Sable and like was just the biggest headache at the time. And if you go back and you look at these shows, you can clearly see every week we're trying to find something for Sonny to do to be outside of people because God forbid we put Sable out there and we didn't put Sonny out. We had to hear it till the cows come home. So LOD 2000, a big part of that was what do we do with Sonny? Wow. Yeah. So repackaging the Road Warriors. Yes. So Tammy stops bitching. Yes. Horrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And she didn't, by the way. This is the beauty of it because you 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 will know I'm not lying about this, okay? The more money you gave Pete Rose, the more he'd do. It, it, it was literally that simple. Like, I'll do this for this. You want me to do that? What? Okay, I'll do that, but that'll cost you this. What? I mean, it, 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 it was like comical, but he would have done anything based on how much money you were throwing at him. It was incredible. Um, he wasn't hesitant to take the move not because the money was right, I guess. Right. Not at all. Not uh -huh. at all. No. Uh, the only other celebrity besides uh, uh, Pete and uh, and Mike is Jennifer Flowers. Now she has she had the affair with Bill Clinton, kind of an odd fit for wrestling. How is she at this? Now Pete's a natural performer, you could tell, and and uh, and Mike Tyson was a fan as a kid. How is she? It, 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 whenever we brought females in, it was it was always tough because they were always afraid. Maybe you could re remember the name. Who was the one at the time that was like the darling of the internet? Um, Cindy Margolis. Cindy Margolis. There you are. They, they always came in. And listen, 
we were always going to push the envelope as far as we could. Well, first and foremost, we were always going to make sure they were safe. So mm -hmm. you go into a situation kind of feeling your way around to what they're willing to do. Mm -hmm. Then the wrestlers would get involved and start working them. You know, they would start working them char their charm and they would make it sound like it was going to be the most exciting thing in the world and completely safe. I mean, that, that's how they sold it. So with the girls, it was a little different. They were afraid. Uh, they were skeptical. Um, at times, we had to talk them into whatever they did. But I, I mean, I will say, first and foremost, we always made sure everybody was protected. Mm -hmm. Is Hunter ready to step out of Sean's shadow now and be the head of the group? I think Hunter is, and nothing against Hunter, but what kind of, what, what, how, what a huge shadow. I mean, right. I, I got to tell you, man, I, in going back and watching this stuff, I, I swear, you know, the more and more I watch this, listen, we know about Austin, we know about The Rock, the the, the height of the Attitude Era would come later. But when I look at Sean and early DX, I, I walk away from every show saying, you know what? He was the best one on the show. I, I mean, Sean Michaels was, was incredible. And you know, it, it's funny because you, know, you watch Sean back then, you have to compare him to Seth Rollins today. You, you have to. They're, 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 they were b both great workers, mm -hmm. both, you know, about the same height, the same weight. But, man, when you put Shawn Michaels up against the Seth Rollins, it, 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 it's like watching Robert De Niro and Bullwinkle. I, I, I mean, it just is. And Shawn was just that good. So I, I think Hunter was ready, willing, and able, but, man, he, he could have fallen flat on his right. face because Sean was just, you know, just a megastar. Waltman's return here. Are you surprised that Bischoff lets him go because it's, a, I mean, it's just a natural yeah, that he would. Would, have, did, have you met Eric Bischoff? Yes, I, I work with right. Eric. Did you notice any arrogance on his part? Like, there's a door, don't let it hit you on the ass on the way out. Well, he, he's, uh, I think he's, he's softened in his, yeah. in his okay. current age. I have to ask JBL. I don't know. Yeah. He talked to him more yeah, recently no, than I, I. That, that, that did not, that, that didn't surprise me at all. You've got Ken Shamrock, you know, the shoot fighting thing is starting now, so, and you've got Dan Severn. There was no comparison on how over one was over the other. Why? I, I, I don't think Dan Severn got it. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, that, it, Shamrock's another one. When I go back and I watch these shows, oh my God, here was an MMA shoot fighter that got it. Yeah. You know, his character over the top, I mean, like, you know, you watch Shamrock and you're like, this guy would kill me if I, he played a character immediately. Dan was always, you know, that straight-faced MMA fighter. I don't think he ever picked up the entertainment aspect of the business. Shamrock got it, you know, I mean, unbelievably. What, what was seen in Dan that anyone thought he would, to, to even give him a shot, just because he was a name? It was just, worth yeah, a shot. Just, just, yeah, exactly. It was a name that was worth a shot. Okay. But I, I just don't think he picked up the, the entertainment aspect of wrestling. He's showing the UFC belts. They show the, the, the clip of fight clips and whatnot. There's some working arrangement with WWE, or they just ask for permission? I, I, I honestly don't know. I okay. was thinking about that myself. I mean, I, yeah, because I, I saw a couple of promotions of, like, MMA um, companies at the time, and I'm like, man, that's odd. I, I don't know what the arrangement was. Severn not working as well as we would have wanted, and, and here we're still doing the NWA angle. Why is this going on any longer? I, I don't know. We're afraid to tell Jim it's not I was going to say, is this still to placate Jim? <laughs> yeah. We're in March. Yeah. yeah. Talk about specifically Rob and the decision 
to go with him long term like that? Is he a guy that you would have hung a title on like that? Is he dependable, et cetera? I didn't never see why he, why he shouldn't have. I mean, he showed up for work. He performed. Sa he, safe to work with? Yeah. I mean, he might have been, well, some people say he was a little stiff, but I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't give a, I didn't care about that. I mean, I, I was always like, if you hit me, I'm going to hit you back. If you hit me hard, I'm going to hit you back hard. You know what I mean? If you light with me, I'll be light with you. If you want to be still, then I'll be still right along with you. So I didn't care. Some people say he was stiff. I, 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 I don't know. Um, Bam Bam had won the title just prior to that uh, from Taz. So Bam Bam was like a one-month transition champion. Do you know why they wouldn't have had the title go from Taz to RVD? Is RVD someone Taz didn't want a job to? Probably. I could see that. Vince and Austin worked well. You have workers that work well individually, but then you've got some that are magic when you put them together. Why were they so great together? God, man, I guess, you know, just two of the greatest performers in the history of wrestling. And, and I, I think so much that had to do with it was, you know, let, let's face it, how many blue collar workers in the, in the world were living vicariously through Steve Austin. How many, how many people would go to work every day, absolutely want to kill their boss, so every time Austin went out there and cut the promo on Vince, he was speaking to them. But my point is, I think the audience had a lot to do with it. I mean, when, 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 when those two were in the ring and cutting a promo, and those people in the, in the arena were just rabid mm. that that has to bring you if you're at a 10 that has to bring you a 12 feeding off that crowd and 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 hearing that excitement and and he, he here's the sad thing there are people on the wwe roster right now like that don't even hear the crowd like that have no idea how to play it's it's it's, it's i i see it every week they don't have they they're, they're they're so focused on trying to memorize their lines are they told to do yes, this? Yes, they now? are. Yes, uh, they are. Okay. Absolutely. Are. It's, it's, it's not on. They don't write the show. Right. They just perform the show. But where Vince and Austin, you know, they are 100% playing off the people. If Vince is saying something and he, and he hears the people getting hot, he's going to stretch it out and stretch it out. And I mean, they were just unbelievable performers. Had Vince been itching to get into the ring? I, I think he was, but he would. He, he would deny that and say, absolutely not. But I think without a shadow of a doubt, he was. Were you nervous at all that he wouldn't be able to pull it off in the ring? That he wasn't going to be able in to pull it ring. off? In the ring. No, no, no. I, I was, I, my nervousness was that he was going to hurt himself because he was going to go out there and be absolutely nuts. Not that he didn't know what he was doing, but that he would try to go above and beyond and maybe try to do some things that at that point his body wasn't capable of doing. That, that was my concern for him. Not that he couldn't pull it off. I didn't doubt him for a second take me to Tuesday afternoon when the ratings come in I gotta tell you it's it was like another day in the office yeah. it, it really was because it was the, the the success of the attitude era was like you just said this week 80 83 weeks it was a 4-6 to a 4-3 all we care about on Tuesday is we want next week's show to be better than last week's. I mean, that, that's always what it was. We want next week's show to be better. So I, I regret now that we didn't stop and smell the roses and we didn't stop and enjoy it more. But when you're you know, live every week, 52 weeks out of the year, there, there literally is no time for that. There's no private moment with you and McMahon? There you, really, you there, I'm, I'm telling you, there really wasn't. Okay. There, there, I, I wish there was. Okay. Yeah. Um, the Stooges debut here. Sure, we got here. a bonus. <laughs> Where's my bonus when we beat them after 83 weeks? I'm sure you got a little bit of a raise yeah. this year. You go from magazine to head writer. I'm sure that entails something. Yeah. The 
classic television thing, the bumbling sidekick, and, and tell me about the genesis of it, picking Jerry and Pat to do it. Uh, yeah. This, without a shadow of a doubt, was one of the, was the most enjoyment I, I had on the show. Because you know what the beauty of it was? And you'll, you'll realize this, because I know you, know you get into acting and all that. I know you love this stuff. He, here's, here's the thing. You know how great it is to sit back and you have two former wrestlers, you know, at that time they were probably, well, well Jerry just, you know, said he, was, he just turned 70. We just saw him. So at this point, they're 60? Yeah. No, wait, wait. No, well, 98, so. 54, 50, 55, yeah. okay. The beauty of this was they, they had no clue how good they were. They just like had absolutely no, right. I, I used to do their vignettes and I used to produce them in the back and I'm not kidding you, I had tears in my eyes. This was the greatest entertainment I had ever seen and neither one of them had a clue right. to how good they were. Which is why it was hilarious. I, I, yeah. Glenn Gilberti points this out all the time. He points it out all the time. I don't know if, if, um, if we had like, uh, just beat Nitro, and it was a couple of weeks after. But I remember Glenn tells the story that that night, like their main event was like Savage and Hogan. And Glenn will tell you the story that, you know, all day at WCW, this is the night we get the ratings back. This is the night we get the ratings back. They were all excited. They were pumping this match, pumping this match, pumping this match. Our main event was Briscoe and Patterson against the uh, the Main Street Bullies. What were they called? Mean Street, Street, Posse. Street Posse. Yeah. In the last segment, it blew WCW out. Glenn, Glenn always uses that, but if that doesn't tell you how old these two guys in their mid-50s were, how over they were in yeah. their mid-50s, it was just incredible, man. Was he close to signing, or was this a, just a ploy? No, I think there was a lot. I think Cornette was talking to Flair. I mean, they would, they've always been good friends, and I, th I think there was a lot of talk between Cornette and, and Flair at the time. I was not involved in this, but I remember hearing about it. So I think there was a possibility that he was coming over. Are you told, as a writer, to maybe get something ready for tomorrow night if this happens? No, no it, it, never, it never got to that point. Okay. No. There's a lot of liability with something like this. Did Vince need a lot of convincing to go with a fire match? Not at all. It, it, it wasn't even that. I mean, obviously, our biggest concern was, what is this going to look like? Right. Listen, man, I, and, and I'll say this right here, because, I, listen, I'll, I'll get beat up for a lot of things. Okay, I'm not going to get beat up for the electrified cage at TNA. That was not my idea. But I remember... I remember I, I was away from, from TNA for a while, and the day I came back, uh, Jeff and Dutch are talking about this electrified cage. Now, I'm sitting there, and you have to understand, TNA has no money. You know, they, they have no money for production. They have no money for special effects, nothing. So immediately, while they're talking about this electrified cage, in my mind, I'm like, what, like, what what is this going to look at? This is TNA. They're not going to be able to pull this off. Unfortunately, it was my first meeting back, so like I really couldn't say anything. But the reason I bring that up is when you go to the Inferno match. Mm -hmm. Of course, that is your first concern. But the difference was there was an MVP in every role at the WWE. Uh, and, 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 you know, no expense was too much. So you knew if we booked an Inferno match, this thing is going to look good. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and, and that, was the, that was the important thing. It wasn't a liability or anything like that. We just wanted to make sure it came off good, and I think it did. Do you think it goes too far uh, against the suspension of disbelief with, like, the, the shooting lightning bolts and, and, and fireballs at each other? Um, we're in a wrestling ring. Yeah. Too much? I think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah.
All right. Where do you get a tank? This is, this is one of my favorites. So I was just telling you about money. There was a guy, and you could read my first book, Forgiven, and I'm not plugging the book. You I want you it. to read about this. I literally almost dedicate a chapter to a guy by the name of Richie Curtis. Richie Curtis was a, 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 a magician by day and the gimmick guy at the WWE, you know, at night. And what, whatever you wanted, whatever you needed to get done, Richie could do. And also Kevin Dunn was a big part of that too. So like this, this is a thing where like whatever I asked for, it didn't matter the amount of money, it didn't matter what it was, it was there. We, we needed a, an expensive sports car to fill up with concrete, it was gonna be there, right. no questions asked. So I'll never forget, I'm, I'm writing this DX Invasion, and I, literally for shits and giggles, I say, you know what, I'm gonna write down that DX pulls up in a rocket launcher. I, I'm, I'm literally entertaining myself saying, there is no way. So sure enough, you know, as always, Vince goes through the script. The script is finalized. It gets sent to Kevin Dunn because they would go over the show. They need this. They need a gimmick chair, gimmick tables, blah, 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 blah. So the show goes to Kevin Dunn. Nobody says a word, right? So I'm already planning in my mind, okay, what's, what's going to be plan B when we get there, right? And sure enough, man, we show up at the building that day, and there's a freaking rocket launcher there and 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 i just sat back and i said i i i i i i could not believe it. it's the first thing you say where did you get this oh I mean, yeah, yeah yeah i mean absolutely i mean I, I just i could not believe there was a a rocket launcher on site and it was richie uh curtis R richie curtis had something but that was also kevin dunn again because that was like a like a bigger stunt but Richie Curtis like when you know the 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 Undertaker uh disappearing in the casket mm -hmm. you know stuff like that unbelievable uh any good behind the scenes stories of shooting this pulling up to uh uh CNN and uh uh, uh, the uh, the scope, I guess it was, right? They Just were in the scope really, this, that night. This was the beauty this was the beauty of the attitude era. We had no idea what was going to happen. <laughs> And the cameras are rolling, and you don't know what's going to happen. You just don't know. The, the, the boys have to be prepared for whatever is going to happen. Just, it's great TV. The episode gets a 5.7. Um, what was last week's rating? <laughs> two, maybe? Two, two, three. Two, was three. it two, three? Okay. And what did this do? 5.7. Five, five, seven. Five, seven. Um, were there fears that WCW would retaliate and come to your show with nah, they were done at that rocket point. launch? That they, was, were, they were done at that point. Really? So never even a thought? No, no. 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 Um, where does this rank with those important Monday Night War moments? I mean, you talked about Tyson really being the kickoff of the attitude. Well, I, I don't think it was just this. Listen, I'm, I'm a big proponent of this, and, and I tried to do this at TNA, and they just did not have the balls. It's, it's that simple, okay? I'm a big proponent of this. If you're number two, you, you throw the kitchen sink at number one. You do everything to antagonize them, to make them take their eye off the ball, and, and any spotlight they give you is going to work to your advantage. So you throw the kitchen sink at them. So a plan was put in place. You know, how, how are we going to irritate, you know, WCW? Mm -hmm. We're number two. We need to throw the kitchen sink. On the other side of the coin, when you're number one, you should pay absolutely no attention to number two. Number two doesn't exist. So the, 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 the DX invasion as a whole was huge. And I'll tell you why I, why I think it was huge. Because I think people at home were literally sitting there, like literally saying, I can't believe they had the balls to do this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I remember, you know, Road Dog and those guys going to CNN. That was a total shoot. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't know if they were going to get arrested. We didn't know if they were going to get thrown out. But I, 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 I imagine the people were sitting at home just saying, I, I can't believe they have the balls to right. do that. And, and, and that's what it was. I mean, so it was just the, the idea as a whole. What place was China in back then? 
I think if she could go back and change this, she would, because I think she was in the wrong place. Because the place she was in was Triple H dictated everything she was going to do. So, like, you didn't even have the conversation with China. You had the conversation with Triple H. And then it just went back to China through him. Yes, yes, yes. Um, how was she in the ring? What did you think? Uh, well, I, I don't think how she was in the ring mattered. She, she didn't really need to be a wrestler. I mean, that's, that's not how we portrayed her. She was portrayed as just a, a, a gorilla and a, and a monster and, you know, the ninth wonder of the world. So, you know, she just really needed to go in there and use a couple of power moves. I don't, I don't think she really needed to be a wrestler. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, I think that would have watered her down. You think it's ironic that for years the Robe Warriors were always... It was always said about them that they wouldn't sell for anybody. And Hawk is taking bumps here for China. Yeah, yeah. And didn't have a problem with it? No, no. You got to remember, with, with the Attitude Era, and, and this was the good thing. I can remember early on, there was a lot of resistance. I can, I can literally, lit, literally remember, like, one of the first shows we wrote that was off the hook. I can remember Pat Patterson literally coming up to me not saying anything but laughing in my face. He, he laughed at me like he was like entertained by it. He laughed at me. But the beautiful thing about this was, you know, un unlike WCW, as we started doing it and the ratings grew and grew and grew and we beat Nitro and the ratings grew and grew and grew, everybody got on board. And reason being, at the end of the day, Everybody on that roster was making more money than they ever made before in their lives, and that's all they cared about. So once we started being successful, man, you, you very rarely got a talent saying, you know what, that doesn't, that doesn't work for me, brother. I mean, you, you, you very, very rarely got it. So it really made it easy. Talk to me about working closely with Vince McMahon. Uh, are you on call 24 hours a day? You're on call 24 hours a day, but he, he, here's the thing that I have to say, because I, I am a workaholic, especially back then, okay? So yes, I was on call, call 24 hours a day, and sometimes it really did suck. My children were small at the yeah. time. I literally can remember being in movie theaters with them on a Saturday afternoon, you, you, there's no way you could not take his call, okay? I had to get, get the boys up, uh, because I couldn't leave them in the arena by themselves, and I had to yeah, take the call. Yeah. I had to get them up, bring them in the lobby, keep, and they wanted to kick it and scream and to go back and see the movie. Keep them quiet, because I couldn't let Vince know. God forbid he knew I was with my family. Okay, so you're it, kidding. So you were kayfabing the fact that you were with your children. Yes, it it, it, it was that taxing. But I, I do have to say this, man. I I was the kind of guy that I I could not wait to get to work back then, and I I never wanted to leave the office. So I was there at the crack of dawn, and I was the last one to leave. But I I, I would I will say this. No matter what time I went in, in the morning, and no matter what time I left. Vince McMahon's car was there. And when you see that every day, you, you can't help but to give the guy 150%. I, I mean, right. it, every day, I mean, no, no matter what time I got, no matter what time I left, he was there. So it's not, he, he wasn't like one of these bosses telling you to do all the work. Right. You know, I, I had that in other places I went to, trust me. Um, he, he was working as hard as uh -huh. anybody else there and you, you know when you saw this and you know you, you you lead by example right you follow suit when that car is in the lot what okay. was he driving at the time i don't, I don't remember you really don't remember a, a bentley i think well, a bentley. i good, think it was good, a bentley good for yeah. Him. yeah There's a little history with you and JYD. I want you to tell us about that on camera. 
was it goes a little something like this. <laughs> <laughs> what had happened? Yeah, what, what had happened was, now I, I had gave dog some uh, some weed, a friend to him, and he never paid me back. This is before the ECW shot, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, he got put on this show that we, we did a pay-per-view. <coughs> he called Tommy Rich's house. <clears throat> As we was all out there having a cookout. And I told him I wanted my money. You got on the phone? Yeah. And he, you know, I ain't getting you nothing, nigga. I said, all right, you gonna pay my fucking money. And uh, he showed up at the show. I walked in, he was there. At first, I ain't say anything to him. He bowed up at me. I let it go. I went in the back and put all my stuff down. I came and got there and I hit it right now. But does Paulie know that you guys have this impending heat? Paulie knew. Paulie knew. And Paulie was like, Jack, whatever he owe you, I'll pay you. He said, I, he, he said well, how? I said, Paulie, he, I said, you owe me $300. He said, I'll pay you. I said, no. You didn't get it from me. You ain't paying me. I said, he going to pay me. I said, I want my money from him. He said, Jack, how much is that? I write you a check. I said, I don't want no check from you. Is Paulie going to write you a yeah, check? Yeah. <laughs> right? I said, I don't want no check from you. I said, I said he going to pay me. And he kept, Paulie, Jack, just give me your word. You ain't going to do nothing. I said, I ain't giving you shit. I said, Paul, I said, I want my money. I said, I want it from him. So when he showed up, he didn't have it. And he let me know he wasn't going to pay me. Even there to your face, he's telling you, I'm not giving yeah, you Yeah, I ain't giving you nothing, nigga. That's what he said to me. He said, I ain't paying you nothing, nigga. I'm the dog. I said, all right. <laughs> and I had a pinky ring on. And I hit him and cut him right on the cheek. He had to change clothes and everything before he got to the ring because his shirt was bloody. And then a couple weeks later, he died. And they blamed that on me. They blame everything on you. <laughs> what timing? The one time you hit, you finally get to hit JYD's dead a week later. <laughs> Do you ever get the money? No. Not even after you hit him that night? No. What happened? I guess it says you go to the you go to the hospital, don't you? Oh, you see a doctor the next day in Georgia. Yeah. And then you scheduled to see another doctor in Philly. What happened? I had been snorting coke. I had been snorting coke before my match. Yeah. And I snorted way too much. And I blew up during the match. That's when Ben was carrying me around the fucking building. He was stalling because, it, it, you know, Paulie wanted more out of the match. I couldn't do no more. My heart was doing about 300 beats a minute. I was done. And Bam kept saying, Jack, you want to go home? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I said, like, go now. Go now. So, and I did the jump. Yeah. I didn't get hurt. I right. blew up. Right. Okay. He picked me up, carried me to the ring, hit me with the finish. What did, you you what did you tell them uh, had happened? He said, uh, numbness in your left arm and leg? I might have said that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> All right. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you the truth. Okay. I might have said that's what happened, but what had happened was. <laughs> what had happened was too much, too much party. Yeah. Is there any reaction internally from Vince to this TV angle? We'll call it an angle. He was showing up. No, no, it was me and him alone at his house. You can't, listen, Vince, Vince McMahon's ego is bigger than this room. Mike Tyson could have challenged Vince McMahon and he would have wanted to show up. The guy's got an enormous ego. I, I think 
we know that. So he expressed wanting to go. The only reason he did not go was because Stephanie was create was graduating from Boston College the same day. The same exact day Stephanie was graduating from college. That was the only thing that prevented him from going. How would that have played out? Who knows? Who knows? What is he saying to you? He, he, he was pissed off. I mean, this, you got to know Vince. This was challenging his manhood. You do not challenge his manhood. So whether it was a work or a shoot, the fact that Eric went out there and did it on national TV, Vince is not going to look like a pussy. So he would, I mean, he, he would have been there if it was anything else but his only daughter graduating college. Uh, in a shoot, who's your money on? I think Eric would have tucked his tail and ran the other way. It wouldn't have even gotten fizzled. No, I, no, I don't think, I, I think he, he would have been flabbergasted. He wouldn't have known what to do. Just like, wait, DX pulled up to the building. What did Eric do? He ordered for them to lower the gates. That's what he did. I think it would have been the same exact situation. Is there any chance, or is this all fantasy, that they would have met, worked something out, and did some no. kind of angle where they were beneficial, not, where not beneficial to point. both companies? Absolutely no. not. Okay. Not, a, not a, no. What did you think of the head gimmick? I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah, I mean, I was the one. Keep in mind, he was there before his Leaf Cassidy. Yes. And then, and then, like, he didn't get anywhere. Um, and, like, I know Vince didn't think highly of him. And then, li literally, one night I was flipping through the channels. We flipped channels back then. And I saw heads being thrown into the ring. And I was like, oh, my God, this is phenomenal. So I went back to Vince and said, listen, I know, you know, Al wasn't one of your top stars. Um, but this gimmick he's doing at ECW is gold. So, I mean, I, I encourage Vince. To... Was there something personal between him and Al? No, just that he was, uh, you know, Mid Carter. Okay. You know, v Vince, like, when you worked with Vince, like, all, all he cared about, and from what I understand, it's the same way today, is, like, what are the top guys doing? Like, all he wanted to know was, like, what, what's Austin doing? What's Rock doing? Everybody else on down the card, that was for us to worry about. He just worried about the top guys. So mid-card is on down. I mean, they were just replaceable. What was the company's relationship with ECW at this time? I, I, don't, I don't know what it was behind my back, but um, I, I'll tell you what I do know that really, really bothered me and pissed me off. And this is why uh, I don't look at Paul Heyman uh, the same way that a lot of other people do. Okay, I don't know what the situation was. I know Bruce Pritchard was involved because he was friends with Paul Lee and he somehow brought Paul and Vince together. Okay, I was told one day by Vince that we have a working relationship uh, with ECW. We're going to give them some of our guys. When we want some of their guys, all we have to do is call Paul and he'll let their guys come over. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm like, okay, fair enough. Now, Vince never watched ECW, didn't know anything about NCW, didn't know any of the workers or anything, okay? So now I was watching, you know, ECW, and, you know, the first guys I had my eye on were the Dudleys. I, I thought, you know, Devon and Bubba, I thought they were absolutely phenomenal. So I went back to Vince. I said, Vince, there's these Dudley guys. I think they'd be great on our show. Um, Vince went to Paul Lee. Paulie came back and told Vince, Vince, I'm sorry, but um, they're, not, they're not interested in coming to the WWE. I I'm sitting there saying, bro, uh, come on, man. You know, then, then it happened a second time with, with a second talent. And, and, and it may have even been out, I don't know, but the same thing. Vince, we got to get so-and-so. Went to Paulie. Uh, sorry, Vince, they, 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 they don't want to come. Okay. All the while, he's accepting the talent that you're sending Absolutely. down there. Absolutely. So now what happens is we just met the gentleman in the, in the, in the, in the dining hall a couple of hours ago. Okay? A third party approached me and said, Vince, the Dudleys want to come to the WWE. It was like a deep throat. So the deep throat put me in charge with the Dudleys. So now I knew these guys wanted to full bore, come to the WWE. 
I set up a meeting with Devon and Bubba and, and Vince McMahon, and then the Dudleys came so in. So this is through a liaison who's not a wrestler, yes. not employed by ECW yes. or WWE, yeah, yeah. but knows you and knows them. Yeah. And, and, and then Taz was the next guy to pretty much follow suit the same way. Okay. So that's why, like, I... You know, listen, you know, Paulie, you know, is, is a saint in professional wrestling. But, like, when, when I look back at, you know, thinking he was holding guys back, uh, that, that just really bothered me. of a wild card, right? Seems like he might have fit right in in that locker room in some ways. Because he had a big mouth. He has a big mouth. Partier. Yeah. Likes that N-word, though. Yeah. But he, he wouldn't say it around me. No, huh? Wouldn't do it. I, I, I've, I've heard him say it, not like in the same room with him, but I've heard he likes to say it. But he never would pull that shit with me. How was he liked by the other guys? He's not there. Jamie was, didn't nobody have a problem with him. Yeah. He actually stayed with me for like about a month. Till he found out the police was looking for him. For for something, for child support or something. Don't you hate when that shit happens, <laughs> Jack? <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Well, what makes Paulie want to bring in Jack Victory? They not really fit the mold. I don't know. I think Rod Price has something to do with it, I think. Because I believe they did work together somewhere, AWA or Continental or somewhere, Rod Price and Jack Victory, I think. But Paulie liked him. How does he fit into that locker room? He was a partier. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh my heart. <laughs> oh man. Jack Jack was a partier, man. He played the game. Did you like working with him? Yeah. I love working with Jack. Me and Jack we 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 would agree. Let's go out there and beat each other to to death. Somebody cut from your mold. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mentioned the equalizer in here. Who was that? Um Equalizer was a guy, I guess at, you did one of our roasts uh, for Terry Funk, remember? Was it the Terry Funk roast? And I, I remember. He, <laughs> do you remember that? <laughs> you might have seen that on video. Sorry. <clears throat> Damn it. I got the apology ready, that's okay. But he was one of the guys that I guess was heckling you. Oh! And you went up and you took the mic and you said something like, uh, you know, you. I don't want to disparage, but I think you accused him of being a runner for maybe Bam Bam's extracurricular. I know what you talk about. All right. Yeah. Called him. I think you called him an advanced mark. You said you're going to get the word <laughs> advanced mark out of me, and that's the best you're going to get, so sit down. <laughs> I remember him. You remember him? Yeah. What was the deal with him and Bam Bam? He was kind of Bam Bam's he was a, runner? He, 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 was, he was his gopher. <laughs> he was. That's all he was. He was a, he was a certified bona fide gopher. <laughs> what was he yelling to you that night at the roast? Did he have issues with you? I, or don't, he was just, I don't remember. No. Dude, I also peeled up that yeah, night. No, I don't I don't remember. Remember. Had a nice outfit on. First of all, how this would work is, you know, a guy would be training to become a wrestler. When, when, when they thought he was ready, because from, his, from the wrestling aspect, mm -hmm. when I would get the call, it was time to, okay, Vince, you need to sit down with him and you need to come up with a gimmick for him. You know, that's why, you know, I sat down with Adam Copeland, with Edge and Christian, and that, that's what I did. So, you know, I got the call that Sean Morley was ready. So I spent a little time with Sean, and the guy was so heavy 
into politics, yes, okay? Stores. First of all, I don't know about politics. I don't care about politics. I've never voted for a president in my life. So I'm, I can't write a political character for, for Sean Morley. I can't, I, I won't know what I'm doing. So the more and more I'm spending time with him and I'm looking at him, I just come to the realization that this guy just looks like a porn star. I mean, like, that's all I could draw out of it. He looks like a sleazy porn star. So I remember, like, go, going in Vince's office and, you know, what, 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 did you meet with Sean Morley? Yeah, what do you think? And I said, I, Val Venus. And I mean, Vince. Where's the name come from? Well, Venus. Right, right, right. But, uh, Venus, what well, rhymes with that? Right, okay. That's it. That's, that's it. That's simple. That's simple. That's I'm a simple-minded man. Okay. I remember Vince called him on the phone right there. I mean, because that's how much he loved the gimmick, right there. Sean Marley was all on board. Here's the, here's the thing about Vince, man, that'll, that just, I, I could tell you so many instances like this. So prior to Val coming in, we're doing a whole bunch of vignettes, okay? At that point, remember, the money's no object, right? right? We get the hottest going porn star at the time, Jenna Jameson, okay, to right. do the vignettes with Val Venus. Right. We're at Bruce Pritchard's house. We have Jenna Jameson in the tub, in Bruce Pritchard's tub, in his house, both of them buck naked. We got Jenna Jameson buck naked. And this is the only way that would ever happen at Bruce Pritchard's house. Probably. Yes. We should make that very uh, clear. Let's make that very clear. Yeah. So we shoot all these vignettes with Jenna Jameson. She was the hottest porn star at the time. I'm excited. Bruce is excited. I go back and I show Vince these vignettes with all the expense and all the work and everything involved. He kills every single thing that Jenna Jameson is in because he thinks she's ugly. And like, I, I, I just, I was like, I was just beside myself. Like, I just. You must have paid her a fair amount of money for this. Yeah, and, and the things she did was just like, but yeah. But um, wow. that, Val Venus is the one guy out of my entire career in the wrestling business that was more over than anybody the first time he came out in the arena. Draz suffers a career-ending injury just a year after he starts. How much potential do you think he would have had long-term had that not happened? It, it's hard to say because he was still developing. You know what I'm saying? Like, he had a great character. He had a great personality. But I really didn't get to see, like, how he was on the mic. You know, I mean, it, you know, it, you know at, at those beginning stages, I mean, you could see it was there, but we really hadn't gotten to the point of defining it yet. So, I mean, that, that's, that's really hard to answer because I hadn't seen enough. Um, how do you think he was as a fit with LOD? Probably a force. Okay. But did they need a third member? No, no. Did, just no. a spot for draws. And a spot for him to learn too. You know, a lot of uh, there's a lot of that involved too. To, you know, on, on why you'll put him with so and so. Because there's something for Joe and 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 Mike to teach him. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I gotta tell you a story about the well, the whack pack. First of all. Since 1983, um, I am, I am a, a Howard Stern mark. Uh, if, if I could be anybody, I'd want to be Howard Stern. I, 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 I wish I was doing what, I wish I had his career. That's really, that's mm -hmm. what I would have wanted to, to do. So obviously I was a fan of his show and I was watching all these whack packers, you know, like weekly, you know. And Stern was hot at the time and I'm like, we got to bring him on the show. So, I'll never forget because it hurt me that day. It really, really hurt me that day. I'll never forget. We're at the gorilla position and it's time for the whack packers. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. Paul Barra is standing there, a man that I cannot 
describe to you the amount of respect I had for, for this man. I mean, what a tremendous, tremendous talent. So here they, they march out in front of him through the gorilla position, out the curtain, and like he's, he's looking at him, you know, like this, like this. I'm bringing up the rear because listen, it was a shoot with these guys like Hank the Angry Dwarf, sure. was the Angry Drunken, Drunken dwarf, dwarf, was really drunk. Of course. It was, all this was a shoot with these guys. Mm -hmm. They were like just lunatics out of their mind. So like I was kind of the wrangler right. because I was mocking at They were the most real thing on that show. Yeah, right, exactly. So they go and, and, and you know, Paul's going like this, like this, blah, blah, blah. Then he sees me looking up the rear and dead serious. He was hot. Dead serious, he looked at me, he goes, you, you just succeeded in killing the wrestling business. And I mean, I felt like, I felt so, th there was part of me that felt horrible. It was a joke. It wasn't a joke, he was really upset. But there was a part of me that felt horrible because this was an iconic figure. But there was the other part of me that was like, like that was kind of a compliment. Because I knew the success of Stern. I knew the success of these characters, and I knew, you know, Paul wasn't from the East Coast. He didn't. He, he didn't get the whole thing, you know. Right. And it was confirmation that that new direction yeah. was not a, a, a fit with the old world, like right, what right. Paul probably was. <laughs>
You think anybody could have worked in ECW? You talked about no. it like being a carnival before. So, or a circus, no? No. Because even if it is somebody who doesn't seem like they fit, anything goes in ECW. Sunday. I'm going to tell you somebody who they crapped on, man. It was, you remember Bull Pain? Yeah. He came each there for a quick minute. Like one, maybe two shows. And they booed him so bad. He came in the back, he told Paulie, he's you ain't gotta pay me. He said, I ain't never come back to this place again as long as I live. He said, the people out there are mean. <laughs> he said, he said, he said, they are mean. What gets you booed by the Philly crowd? Um, me? No, no, one. What gets one booed by the Philly crowd? Messing up. The, if, if, I never got it, you fucked up. I never got that. Mm -hmm. Thank God, I never got it. But I heard a lot of people who did get it. And the fans are so smart. You know what I mean? They know. Right. And if you mess up, they're going to let you know. If you do good, they let you know. If you mess up, they're oh, they going to be the first ones to tell you that you fucked up. Talk about the heat that comes with ECW's treatment of women sometimes in the ring. Men on women violence, not the women fighting, the men on the women. A lot of people didn't like it. You know what I mean? A lot of people didn't like it. Um, they, there were some complaints about, you know, why was Paulie doing it? You know what I mean? And. Just a lot of them didn't like it. But the women themselves, they didn't, didn't, care. didn't feel like they were being put in a position. No, that was... they didn't care. Francine would ask for it. I mean, honest to God, she would ask for it. She, she wanted to be right in the mix. She didn't care if it was a guy or a girl, two guys. She didn't care. I'll tell you a great Vader story. We, we had a live Raw, and Vader was the first one out the shoot for the live show. Vince is sitting at the gorilla position where he always was, and it literally is a minute to nine. Vader's nowhere to be found. Vince is going freaking ballistic. Okay, where's Vader? Where's Vader? Where's Vader? Bruce is running around looking for him, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, Bruce is saying, you know, you know, hold the intro, hold the intro. And Vince says, we can't hold the intro, we're live, damn it, you know, the whole yeah. line yards. No Vader, no Vader, no Vader. Vince has no, he's got to shoot the pyro. That's how we opened every right. show, the pyro, blah, 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 here comes the pyro, blah, 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 blah. The announcers are on, he's telling the announcers to string it out, he's going absolutely ballistic now. No Vader, right? So now all of a sudden, nobody can find him. The announcers, you can tell that, okay, the announcers are talking a little too much. Something's wrong. I think Vince sent the opponent first, you know, but still we didn't know, like, is there going to be a match? We don't, we don't know what we're going to do. It's live TV. All of a sudden, from underneath the stage, Vader comes walking out, pinballing into the walls, like not knowing where he was. He was under the stage stretching when the pyro <laughs> went off right next to him. Almost deafened him. And he came out like could not even walk a straight line, was bouncing off the walls, and had to literally walk directly to the ring. Maybe wow. that's why they, we took the mask off him. Wow. Does that warrant taking the mask off? No. no it's right. It's... Was yeah. he covered in soot? And uh, it, black? I'll, I'll never forget that. Virgil Only he could have done that. Only he could have done that. Um, was there a locker room reaction or a company reaction to hearing this? Well, I mean, there's a reaction to every time it happens, man. You know, I mean, it's such a tight-knit group and a tight-knit family. And, you know, so many people, you know, 
worked with them. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there was always, you know, there was always a reaction. You know, it was, it was every time something like that happened, man, it was so hard to go out and perform. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you realize with this tight-knit community, you know, you have to justify, well, that's what he would have wanted. So it's almost like you go out there and you do the show in his honor and in his memory. Had you ever met him? Yeah, I did. I actually, I actually uh, w w spent the call ride with uh, JYD probably back in 91. Okay. Yeah. Is this a shoot? Oh, absolutely. You, you can go back to um, the week before he started the NWA thing. Um, this is probably an early episode in January 98. Oh, he sh like shot all over me on TV. You know, but, you know, basically there's a Yankee in the office and this, that, and the other thing. I mean, right before uh, the NWA. So, you know, again, this, is, this isn't like, this isn't Jim in particular, but this is the issue that I had with a lot of guys, um, you know, who fell under that umbrella. Jim had an opinion of what professional wrestling was still supposed to be in 1999. His opinion didn't matter. You know, nobody's opinion mattered. All that mattered is this is a business. You got to get as many eyeballs watching your product as possible. Sure. You sell more merch, you sell more house show tickets, you sell more pay-per-view buys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, th this was always one of the issues with Jim. This was his opinion, but it's not, a, it's not about opinion. But is it okay in a way that he does this as a shoot on the air? Because we're in an era now, we're going towards the Attitude Era, where he may not realize it or not, but he's participating by doing this Absolutely. in your brand Absolutely. of wrestling and not... Right, and, and not, but not only that, what, what, he, what he really doesn't understand is as more and more and more people are going with this, he's making himself look silly. Because, you know, with, with what he's talking about, he's kind of in the minority now. So it's, you know, but like I said, man, if it's, if it's good TV and he wants to go out there and shoot, then let him go out there and shoot. I'm going to ask you two questions. First, from the perspective of the ECW locker room, when one of your own gets called up, you generally happy for them? Do you look at them as a sellout? No, never. That's part of the business. I told Mustafa a long time ago, I said, if you get called and I don't, I said, go. I said, because if I get called and you don't, I'm going. All right? I said, that's part of the business. So everybody in the locker room, they, we knew that was part of the plan. You know, some was going to get called and some wasn't going to get called. If you did get called, you better go. You'd be in the, at the bank money cashing that check, talking about I sold out. Thank you very much. So, so what's with the ECW fans with the sold out? So just that they feel like they had ownership of you guys and yeah. they didn't want to share you with anyone? Yeah. It was a little selfish. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> selfish bastards. <laughs> What was his gimmick originally supposed to be? Was it supposed to be part of the brood right away? Did you have something else in mind? Originally, and I think even, even Adam doesn't understand this. Originally, remember the girl was doing the voiceover on his vignettes? You heard a female voice? Okay, yeah. Originally, he was, not, he was almost supposed to be a Tommy character, like not talking. You didn't know if he was a mute. You didn't know what the situation was. So that, that was the idea of, of bringing him in as this cool character, almost like a Tommy-type character that did not talk at the beginning. And then we were going to eventually, you know, turn him into the character that he became. But I guess then with the, um, you know, once we had Gangrel and once we had Christian and knowing, you know, that picture of the three of them looking together, that's how it transformed into the bird.
Now, Austin specifically, how dangerous is, is him going down with the staph infection at this point? Because he's, he's the world champion, he's the star of your TV show, and uh, you got a pay-per-view a week away. Are you scrambling for a plan B? Well, but, but again, that th this is the beauty of the Attitude Era and getting everybody over. In other words, if an Austin gets hurt, it doesn't all come crumbling down. You have so many other strong players in place that if you got to switch out parts for a week or two weeks or a month, you can do that. That's the importance of getting everybody on the roster over. Um, it says that Vince actually needed to be convinced by his road agents that he should cancel some of the shows to let these guys heal up and, and get ready. Um, You've got, uh, was it Lanza, Gurria? What are Vince's relationships with his road agents? Are they his closest confidants? Well, I, I, I'd say not really, but Pat was. I mean, Pat was always the guy, and still is to this day. I mean, Pat was the confidant, I mean, without a shadow of a doubt. work I can't really say too much because I'm not a big Van Damme fan from what aspect as a worker or as a person personally okay why he bad-mouthed me one time during an interview and I didn't understand it because I never had anything bad to say about him I could have what do you say about you he told a guy, the guy that was uh, giving the interview, he said that he said I, he said I couldn't work, and uh, that's what started the whole thing with me and him. He said I couldn't work, and he said something about something I couldn't work or whatever. And of course, I had to come back and say what I had to say about it. You know what I mean? Uh, I hadn't seen him since TNA, when we did a thing down with mm -hmm. TNA. But uh, I've learned that uh, uh, what works for me a lot of times is if I don't like a person, I won't talk about them, period. You know what I mean? That works for me, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? and. I'll say as least as, 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 as you know, at least as I as, as I can mm -hmm. about them. You know what I mean? Just from so don't even put them over. You know what I mean? And that's what happened with me and him. We never really we 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 might have been in the ring together maybe twice. In ECW, I think one time it was me. It was me. It might have been me and Cronus against him and Sabu. And a little three way with somebody else involved in it. And we hooked up a couple of times, and then, you know, that was it. But uh, that's basically it. Was his complaint that you couldn't work, was he talking about like the use of weapons and stuff as opposed to wrestling? Yeah. Your complaint about him was, I mean, he was a good worker, in your opinion? No, I just said that. Uh, what I thought about him working, I said, I thought it was garbage. You know, I said, you want to get in the ring and, you know, choreograph that bullshit y'all good in there and do, then okay, so be it. But if, to say I can't work, right. then I can say the same thing. You can't either. You know, I don't have to say what I'm going to do. They already know. You know what I mean? Would he pre-plan a lot of his 95% of, his of it was. You know, and uh, I didn't appreciate it. Said <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> you know, and uh, I fired back. A, what's your reaction backstage? 
horrified. I mean, literally horrified for his well-being. Is the whole, is it kind of like a universal gasp yes. in the room when this yes. happens? Yes. You guys like rush to the curtain or no, you still well, watch I mean, the we're, TV? We're, we're, we're right behind the curtain at the monitor. Um, when he comes through after the match, because he obviously continues, is he coherent? Is, is there anything noticeable that maybe he's been knocked a little <laughs> I, loopy? I, I just had him on my show and I told him this story because he didn't even remember it. I'll never forget, um, I'm sitting at the gorilla position. They came, they wheeled him back, you know, on a gurney. There was a guy at the WWE that, um, you know, I, I don't even know what you would call him, but he, you know, he took care of the guys and put him back in place. Uh, his name was Francois. The he French was a guy, right? Yeah, the French yeah, guy was yeah. a character within himself. <laughs> Francois was there on the scene. They're wheeling him back. Francois over him. I, I went along. Okay, so now Francois gets him alone in, in the back room and it was Mick, Francois, and me. And I remember Francois left to go get something or whatever he had to do and it was just me and Mick. And I'll never forget, man, his literally, his, his teeth was, was like through his lip. Yeah. I mean, he just looked about as bad as anybody could look, okay? And I'll never forget, I'm worried to death. I don't know if anything's wrong with him, if it's serious. I'll never forget, he looked up at me and he said, Vince, he goes, was it better than Sean's match? That's all he cared about. That's all he cared about. And I remember my instinct was, you know, like, are you out of your freaking mind? You know, you got two babies at home. What do you, th I mean, like I was like hot at him. But that just tells you, like, mix all, all he cared about was wanting to top that Taker Sean match. Was he always planning to do this? No, the second one was an accident. The, the first spot. Th the one through the cage yes. was the accident. Yeah, the, but the, the one yes, yes. off the top was yeah. planned. Yes, yes. And everyone knew, well, I mean, the creative knew beforehand. Well, not, not creative, not creative, because at this point, like, when we go to the building, like, you know, we tell them what the finish is. At that point, the talent gets together with the agent, and they lay out the match. So when I sit down to watch this match, I don't know what's in the body of this match. So would it have been Pat? Whoever was the agent of the match. Of that match. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Why was the decision made to go with Ken? Just because, again, listening to the crowd, listening to him being over. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm going back and looking at some of these shows now, and I'm like, God, why didn't we have Ken in Austin? You know, I mean, how how huge would that have been? How good would I, I wouldn't have even known. Like looking at it, I was like, how would I have written Austin versus Ken? Because there was a point in time, you know, coming off of the Rock. Where, I mean, the guy was over huge. Yeah. I mean, he was the, the working the top of the card. Was there any ever, ever any consideration to give him a, a title? God, I, I, I don't worked? remember that far back. And I wish I knew because, right. like I said, I'm watching the show now and I'm saying, why didn't we book him with Austin? Uh, okay. You know, mm -hmm. so, like, I, I don't know. Mabel won in 1995. I don't think they were listening to the crowd. No. In no, that, no. You know, Vince likes his big guys. You know, yes. and he wanted, he wanted to, he wanted to give. That's an example. Of wanting to give somebody a push, right. but they weren't buying it. This comes from why I have heat with JBL to this day. Okay, I was in the back. Um, it was me and somebody else, and I don't remember who it was, and JB started carrying on that he could take anybody in the company or in the locker room in a real bar fight, okay? Now, first of all, like, I was not a big fan of JB personally, JBL personally. I thought he was a big bully. I thought he was a loud mouth. So all I had to do was sit back and hear him say how he could take anybody in a bar fight. Now, keep in mind, while he's saying this, I know some of the guys in the locker room. And while he's saying this, I'm like, I say to myself, you know what, I'd love to see that. 
you know. So sure enough, the next TV session with Vince, I, I pitched it. I said, Vince, I said, listen, I, I, I pitched the whole idea of the Brawl for All. You know, let's do this. Uh, got, guys were bonused if they did it. They got more money. That mm -hmm. was the enticement to do it. Uh, it was so funny because, like, the first rounds, uh, you know, being in the arena, people thought it was a work. People were like, what? why are they dimming the lights? Why are they right. doing this? They thought it was an absolute work. By the time... Uh, Bart Simpson started rolling guys' eyes in the back of their head. Uh, people, part gun. Part gun, yeah. yeah. People, people knew it was not a yeah. work anymore. And, uh, you know, to see, uh, to see Bart drop JBL, <laughs> I'm not going to say that was a sad day. I thought it was a great day. I, I, this is what I'll never forget, though, man. I, I swear, this, I'll never forget this. The Godfather. Yeah. This is a guy that's the real deal. This guy will kill you. I mean, this he's the real deal. I'll, I'll never forget. I mean, literally, you, anybody can go back and look. Bart hit him so hard, his eyes rolled to the back. I, I never in my life saw anybody get hit that hard. Nobody in the world expected any of that from Bart Gunn. Nobody, he wasn't even on anybody's radar. Right. Um, is there a faction of wrestlers that are not participating in this that think this is taking up time? Not on the really, show because that, no, they they want to see these. They want marks. Oh, for absolutely, it. yeah, yeah. And a, and another big controversy too, huge controversy was uh, Mero, uh, because you know Mero wasn't a guy that was liked in the locker room because of Sable. And, uh, you know, he, he was a gold gloves legitimate mm -hmm. boxer. Mero was, you know. And uh, he felt that he beat JBL beforehand, and he felt that he got totally uh, screwed out of the victory, you know, because nobody liked him. Right. And he was hot. I mean, he was legitimately hot. Who were some of the tougher guys in the locker room that didn't participate that you were surprised or you thought may have had a good shot but just chose not to do it? Well, God, man, I... I the, the entertaining factor at the moment was JR, bless his heart, just spoke to him a week ago, was just telling anybody that would listen how Dr. Death was just going to walk through this thing. And like it was getting to the point where like even Vince was like rooting against Dr. Death. Like everybody was rooting against Dr. Death. And then, of course, you know, he lost. But, you know, with all due respect, I think he really tore his, like, his uh -huh. eye muscle up to his, I mean, a really hideous, horrible injury. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, but uh, I, I think Severn was with the company at the time, and he didn't participate in this thing. Mm -hmm. I don't remember, did Blackman participate? Yeah, he actually beat, he's the one that beat Mark Merrow. And then what happened? To who? To, to Blackman. Um... Who took Blackman out? I don't know. Maybe no. It's, I, he, he might have pulled out or something for some reason, but Steve Blackman was the real. I mean, just if he had like this much of a personality and could cut this much from a promo. I mean, nothing against him. That, that no, just I, wasn't his tool. If he could have cut a promo, he, he, that guy could kill you with his bare hands. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was, he was, he was the real deal. Who was your money on before it had started to go all the way? Um, probably uh, Godfather. First of all, who's your favorite in that role? Oh, that Ro Road Dog made D'Lo Brown's career. I, I tell D'Lo to this day, and he 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 admits that he, D Road Dog gave D'Lo Brown a career that day. Any blowback for using blackface after thirty years after to become imagine? unacceptable? No, no, but here 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 was the thing. Here here was the thing. I mean, this is what sucks so bad about the wrestling business today. I I cannot tell you the last time a chance was taken in the wrestling business. This was a thing up front where you knew this was going to be really, really good or this was going to be really, really bad. There was going to be no in-between. And I mean, I knew that going in. 
But when they came out, you know, I'm talking about from the locker room, mm -hmm. and they were made up, and I saw <laughs> what they looked like, I felt good about it. Mm -hmm. Then when they were walking the ring and, and uh, Road Dog started the D-Lo head, I felt better about it. Mm -hmm. Then when they all started talking and doing the thing, I was like, thank God. I mean, that, that was a thing that was like, that was totally like them. Because like I said, it was either going to be great or it was either going to be horrible. And those guys knocked it out of the park. Hey, but now what about the real nation? Are they, are they on board from Jump Street? And are they enjoying it when it's going on? Well, they're, they're, if they're not on board, they're not saying it. Okay. But I, I, I don't think I don't think there was any issue because at the end of the day, it it got the angle over, and in turn, it got them over. So I, I don't think anybody had an issue with it. Okay. The Mizark written on on a Xbox shirt. Story behind? It? No, that was that was all him. Okay. That, that was not by design. <laughs> This is like, this just goes to show you, like, people like, oh, Vince, you know, you, uh, you know, you're so successful at WWE and you were a failure at WCW. Oh, it's because Vince McMahon was the editor and this, that, and the other thing. Okay. Ed Ferrara comes in because, you know, it's, it's just me and Vince writing the TV at the time. Mm -hmm. Cornette was gone. And it was like, I only got with Vince when the TV was done. So I really wanted somebody there that I could bounce things off of back and forth. Ed comes in on a trial basis immediately. He's Italian. He's from Jersey. He is probably like the smartest individual I've ever met in my life. Um, I, 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 I can't, you can't hold me down and really dot I's and cross T's. He's the detail guy. So immediately, like, I, I hire him. I told Vince, hire him, hire him, hire him. Which, which right there um, is something that's not in the norm in wrestling because I should have looked at Ed as a threat, as anybody would. Oh, would not, I would have cock-blocked him. Nah, you don't want to hire this guy. Anybody okay. else would have done that. But I said, no, he can make the product better. He can add to the product. But I, I compare that to WCW because when you look at the same set of circumstances, you know, Brad Siegel one day decides oh, you and Eric Bischoff are going to work together. Meanwhile, Vince Russo was writing the, w the WWE television when we wound up kicking the backsides of WCW. Eric Bischoff loses his job, and I wind up replacing Eric Bischoff. Right. So how Brad Siegel in his mind thought, okay, these, these two go never met. But that's what I mean. People never want to look at the facts. But like with Ed, I, I was the kind of guy that, listen, man, whoever can help us make this product better, bring him on board. Uh, from a, res uh, from a, um, a responsibility standpoint, like how did you two work together? Uh, two people creatively writing music or doing anything um, might have two different perspectives on things. One might be stronger with this, weaker with this. What was the music you were making with Ed? You want to hear how ridiculous this is, okay? You, you look at the product today and, you know, the, 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 the 25, the 30 writers, whatever there is, okay? Ed Ferraro would come to my house. We would probably start at about 10 o'clock in the morning, okay? This is when the Jerry Springer show was on fire, Yeah. okay? Ed would come to my house in Connecticut, Springer was on like three different channels, um, one right after you, like a three-hour block of Springer. We would sit there at 10 o'clock. We would start writing the show. Springer would be on in the background, okay? We'd watch Springer till 1 o'clock while we're writing. 1 o'clock, there, uh, there was a mall in Trumbull, Connecticut, right across the street from my house. Ed and I would walk to the mall and eat lunch. Uh, by the time we got back, it was 2 o'clock. We'd work from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Ed would leave at 5 o'clock, and we would have our show. It was that simple. At that point, we have our show. The next day, we go to Vince's house, and we pitch and lay out our show to Vince. It was that simple. How, how it's gone from that to 25, 30, whatever, the, I have no idea in the world. But 
we were just two guys face to face, rifting back and forth, respecting each other's ideas, being on the same page with the same goals, and um, it worked. Vince obviously begins to see value in him too now and sees you two as a team. Um, you become friends. Well, tell me one thing that, that Ed was 100% responsible for that we remember, laugh at, whatever. What was oh, a, man. What was an, an Ed Farrar creation that you always admired? God, it's hard to say because, I mean, we, we really did, like, we really did work on everything together. He was a lot like Vince in, 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 the, in the aspect that, like, I would throw something big out there, and then Ed at that point would kind of help, you know, fine-tune it and really create it to, to what it would become. So I, I, I just, I can't think, like, off the bat of, you know, his idea or no, my fine. idea, I mean, but I, that's how we worked. I loved Dilo, man. I, I loved Dino Dilo because he was a company guy. He was a hard worker. Um, I loved the gimmick with the chest protector. I mean, I thought I thought that was great. But uh, he he was just always always one of my personal favorites. The European title necessary? No, mm -mm. just one of those things. Yeah, and no, so. I, I I couldn't even tell you how it came about. I mean, I really couldn't. But uh, no, it, it wasn't necessary. Is this a plant? Never. Never? Never. None of them? Never. Never. The guys thought it, when they would come back and they thought it was the greatest thing. It was never a plant. Just something that took off because they'd see it on TV the week prior or they... Yeah, you know, or I mean, you know, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's been done at rock concerts, you know, it's not the first time it was... But at a wrestling but No, show. absolutely not. But no, it just... Imagine some of the women in 1985 at the... You know, yeah. <laughs> Moolah, Wendy, Rick, the main event, <laughs> yeah. pulling those yeah. dogs no, out. No, I, I, yeah. Holy but no, Moses. that was not a, they, they were never, ever plants. Um, was that an ad lib, Hunter, getting the first girl to do that? Probably, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, we talked about Paul E. thinking stuff is good for TV, but now you're in you're in an, an area where lawsuits and all that shit, right? Real problems could happen. You ever pull you guys together and say, "Let's let's tone it down," especially the Dudleys inviting guys in the ring. They'll fight the toughest guy. You ever told by Paul E. Turn it down. It's too much. No, it's always we got each other's back. That will say it more than anything. Because I mean, it was, I remember one time. Speaking of bubble, we was in a Buffalo, and we went to a strip club afterwards. And a fan came up to me. He was at the show. He was talking shit about Bubba. He was like, "Jack, if I ever see Bubba, I'm knock him out because I don't like him. You know, because he's a cheater. He's whatever." I'm like, "Yeah, well, whatever, man." And walks Bubba. Fan sees Bubba walks up to Bubba, starts arguing with him. I hit him. You did? I hit the fan. And then Bubba jumped on him. And then we both jumped on him. And the cops came and it was a whole nine, but didn't nobody go to jail. Paulie asked me what happened, I told him. I said, I gotta make money with this guy. So I got his back from A to Z, you know what I mean? I said, I'll worry about the consequences later. I'm like, well, right now I got his back. You know, and that's how we, that, that's how we roll. Well, but you, now here you're in the same room with each other, I guess for the first time, right, since this happened, when you go to the courtroom. Eric Kulash and yourself. Yeah. 
say anything to each other or you just stay apart? I winked at him. <laughs> Does father call you any names? He called me in, <laughs> in the courtroom. He called me in neither. No, no. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what happened. His dad got up there and he, he said what he had to say. Well, anyway, Paulie ended up coming up. He mm. called Paulie to come up, testify. So Paul E. was telling the judge, you know, telling the court what happened, his version. And he said that, um, the judge asked him, he said, well, did, 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 did Mr. Kulaz ever call Mr. Young out his name? And Paul E. said, yes, he called him the N-word. And the judge said, well, for the record, you can say, you know, he said, he called him the N-word. You know, he said, I want to leave it at that. And he said, well, for the record, you can say what he said. Paulie looked at me, looked at the jurors. It was one old dude, one like 80 year old black dude in the jury. And he was falling asleep the whole time. He was it just gnawing back and forth, man. But then they started talking about this. He came, he, he came to me, he's like, he looked at me. He says, I'm sorry, Jack. He says, he called him a nigger. And bro, I slid out of my seat and just come. <laughs> I was like, no. And the old black juror was like, he started writing it down. But uh, he did say that. Did you think it would ever get this far? Where, no. Where it's going to a, to a try? I mean, the, you, in essence, do this as wrestlers in ECW do they all offer, the time. Do they, they offer me time. They offer me time. They was offering me. They was offering me a one, one do. Wait a minute, five do one. To take a guilty. Yeah. Thing? They offered me that while they was while they was out deliberate. He was still coming back with the, with the same offer. He said, he said, it's now or never. He said, we can end this right now. This was the DA. You want to end it? We can end it right now. He said, but five do one. Five years? Yeah. Five years? Yeah. Yeah. Is it because he was a minor? It was because of what I did and because of the, the, the actual charge. It was in a wrestling ring. Yeah. Uh, it just. But they made it seem like it was outside in the alley. You and Paulie have a good laugh about the, the, the nigger moment in the yeah, after <laughs> afterwards? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Paulie's performance. Somebody should have got that on camera. <laughs> Sable's hand bikini, which has become like an iconic symbol of the Attitude Era. You're shaking your head? No. Uh, no, because I'll never forget the story. I think I was smitten with Sable, and I think Mark knew that. Like I just, and I was close friends with Mark. And don't get me wrong, listen, I never, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to say anything or make rude remarks or anything like that. Maybe you could tell it by the look in my eyes. Like every time when I looked at her, I was. She had these eyes. If you looked in her eyes, like you just, you melted. It was that kind of a thing. It wasn't like, oh, I want to do Sable. Right. It, was, it wasn't that. Okay. So I think Mark knew that. So it's the day of this big bikini contest. And imagine this now. I'm, I'm smitten with this girl. And he comes and finds me and says, Sable wants to show you her bikini. This is hours before in the, in, in the locker room. So I'm like, okay. You know, so he brings me to her private locker room, and it's just the three of us there, and she's wearing a white robe. Okay? Can you imagine... She opens up that robe, and that's what I see. Can you like what? 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 What could I possibly say? Do you play about, cool? What do you say? Like, how can, I'm Ralph Crampton. I'm hum the hum the hum the. How, how, how do you play that cool? I was so hot at him doing that for me. I was like, how can you like? What? What, what am I supposed? Oh yeah, you look good, say. But I looked. What am I supposed to say? But oh my God, I when I saw that, I uh, I thought I was going to have an absolute heart attack. There was something. Listen, I know divas have come and gone, 
And I, I, I didn't even see any of Sable's second run. I didn't see any of that. But I've worked with hundreds and hundreds of girls in the business. There was just something about her, man, that... When was the last time you talked to Rena? I just, you want to hear a funny story? I wanted her to come work at TNA, okay? So I got her phone number, and I called her on the phone, right? A guy answers the phone. I said, can I please speak to Rena Merrill? Yeah, who's this? Well, this is, you know, Vince Russo, I work for TNA, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He puts Rena on the phone. I laid out this whole spot I have for her at TNA. I want to bring her into TNA, this, that, and the other thing. She's excited about it, this, that, and the other thing, right? I'm at Jeff Jarrett's house. So I hang up the phone. I'm, we're ready to, I'm ready to now say, you know, Jeff, call, we need to talk money, whatever the case may be. So all of a sudden, 10 minutes later, freaking Kurt Angle calls me. And he goes, what did you, Vince, what did you do? And I'm like, what, what, are, you talk, what, what are you talking about, Kurt? I didn't do anything. What are you talking about? He goes, Brock Lesnar wants to freaking rip your head off. I said, what are you talking? I said, I've never even met Brock Lesnar. He goes, no, you never met Brock Lesnar, but you just, you just talked. talked to him on the phone. You didn't introduce yourself, and then you tell him to put his wife on, you know, put his girlfriend, I think girlfriend on the phone. He goes, he wants to freaking kill you. He's calling me, asking him who, who the F you are. Meanwhile, I didn't know she was living with Brock Lesnar. How the heck am I supposed to know she's living with Brock Lesnar? So long story short, I... <laughs> Having dad call Rena Morris number since. I guess she didn't come over and no, she and did not come over. Haven't spoken to Brock since. No, no, Very good. No, no. What percentage of Lawler's like insane horny puppy stuff is is a put on, and how much of it is him? I think it's all him. <laughs> it's just all Lawler, man. He's just he's just incredible. Going back and watching those shows now, man, he's just so <laughs> funny. I, I go back now, man, because listen, I didn't real. I, I was there for the shows. I never really got to watch them. Right. When I go back now and I listen to Lola and and Jr. It, 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 it's, it's a joke, the announced team they have today. It's not even like major league and like high school baseball. It's, it's an absolute joke. The mastery of the announcing between those two guys was unbelievable. Who comes up with the Godfather and says this is the right thing for Charles? I think it was more Vince than me. Like I don't think the Godfather was like a character that I came up with. It, it either came from Vince or it came from a conversation that Charles had with Vince. But that it did not, I mean that, that was not one of my babies. What about the idea to have the hoe train and bring scantily clad I think, strippers? I think that was, was that him. Steve Lombardi's? Or no, no, or no, 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 no. I actually think that was Charles. Charles. Yes, yes. Yep. Through his connections in Vegas, perhaps. Yes, perhaps. Um, when you go city to city, what's the process for finding the girls? Is this something also that gets handed to Kevin Dunn? Uh, yes, it is. Yes. Really? Okay. Yep. Yep. So they have casting people, I guess, that, uh, that man, are accessible? Man, you got to see, man. There's one show early on you got to see. I popped huge. Sean's in the um. Remember when Sean popped out of the casket, as he's supposed to be? You thought it was Taker, right? And Sean yes. about that. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Sean was supposed to pop out of the casket with two hot chicks. Okay. He goes in the ring and he cuts a promo and he basically says. I was supposed to pop out of cast with two ashes, but they were absolute dogs, and I refused to do it, which I thought was just brilliant, uh, you know, and absolutely hysterical. First of all, nobody but Sean would have turned that down. You know, second of all, to go out and literally call these girls dogs was just, it was just, it was, it was phenomenal. You're classy guy. Classy guy. Um, um. Any crazy stories with having these women backstage? I can't imagine. Not, a, not, a, not, not that I. Full of not not that I stuck my nose in, man. Trust me, right. I stayed far away from that. Who might have been, if anybody had the proclivity to do so? Who might have been the one that um, pursued the hoes uh, the most in the locker room? We gave them a lot of extra attention. Oh, God, bro, I think they would have been up for grabs, to be honest with you. With that whole crew? I think so. Yeah. All right.
clearly we need another hour of television for you to write. Mm -hmm. um, how does it come about? Whose suggestion is it? it? It was so hot at the time, they just wanted more programming, you know, because it just meant more money. Uh, and, and that was really the beginning of the end because, like, Heat was an hour show and, like, it wasn't like a focused show. It's like a B show. Mm -hmm. But when SmackDown came, I mean, that, that, that was a whole other story and that was pretty much the breaking point. People might not realize uh, it's tough to write a one hour episodic television for a year, a year, 26 weeks, and keep people coming back. Now, you got to do 52 weeks. Mm -hmm. And now they're adding hours and hours and hours to this. Um, do you realize that there's only so much that you're going to be able to... The, the, the way we worked, absolutely. Yeah. Because we, we literally, I mean, we, we gave everything we had to write the best draw we possibly could. So, yes, the more, the more you add, uh, and, and you know, we weren't going to water down the product. So the more you add, the, the harder it was going to be on us. Shane McMahon is on the show. Um, how was Shane treated by the other wrestlers? Did they respect him or did they see him as the boss? Well, I, I, here's another great story. His first match was against X-Pac. I don't know if you're going to get into that soon. But the thing was, he showed up at the pay-per-view and had like a 26-page match written out for his first match ever, Shane. Like Randy Savage styles. Yeah, and he gave it to Sean Waltman. So, you know, that got around the locker room in a hurry. However, when he went out there and performed that match, he came in the back and people were like, holy, and it wasn't because it was Vince's kid. It was holy crap. So it, it, it did not take him a long time to earn the respect. There, there were, with, with Tiger Ali Singh, first of all, I liked him. He was a nice guy. He looked great. There was some, there was some like, issues on the management level. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, his father was involved, and I don't know if it was a pay thing. There, there was something going on talent relation-wise that never really allowed us to continue pushing him. So it had nothing to do creatively with, no, with the no. character there, or there, his there, performance? There was something, okay. something going on. Is there a part of you that maybe when you're watching you know what, it on the monitor that goes... These are, these are the things that people want me to apologize for. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Are you kidding me, well, choppy, choppy? I'm going to apologize for that. That's classic. In this case, yeah. is this a little too juvenile? Even I think for you I, and Ed? I, I'm laughing right now. I'm 54 years old for crying out loud. I think it's tremendous. <laughs> Where did you find, um, let me read Phil Mushnick's review oh, in the great. New York Post of, of, the, of this. While there's no longer room for boxing on USA, the network recently added an hour of WWF programming at 7 p.m. on Sundays. Family viewing hour. Recently, WWF on USA provided its youthful live TV audience with a castration angle, the details of which I cannot come close to printing. Um, choppy, choppy, pee pee, calls a castration, castration angle. <laughs> Um, first of all, where did you find Mrs. Yamaguchi-san? Can I tell you something? Somebody, I, I was doing one of my podcasts the other day, and somebody was putting over how gorgeous this girl was. Like, I didn't even remember the character at all. Really? So I have no idea. Um, Mushnik is a name you're going to see a lot in the future, with writing and being very critical of, of Vince. Is, is Vince very vocal of his hatred of Phil Mushnik? Man, I got to tell you, back in the day, like we weren't even allowed to talk about the, the internet wrestling community, the dirt sheets or anything. All this time when I was writing all this, I never, ever, ever looked at a dirt sheet. Well, New York Post, though. I mean. Yeah, yeah. Really... But nah, I, I think it was more when it was the steroid trial and it was like serious right. stuff. I don't think he. But this he wouldn't give a oh, shit about. Heck no. Okay.
You sometimes hear about wrestlers like today on Raw, they all get together and they watch the monitor and stuff. In ECW, you talked about not being too concerned, but were there matches that guys would go to the curtain and try to watch or try to get to a monitor and watch? They watch the monitor. Because it was like, like a Terry Funk would bring people to them. Who would bring people to a monitor? Well, I mean, you basically, watch? Ba basically, I mean, every match, people, you had to watch the monitor. I mean, but I mean, you know, if, if, if you was just there. If, but as a fan, who would you want to watch? I didn't watch nobody. I, <laughs> I, did. I didn't. All I knew was to let me know what my match was, the, the match before mine. That's Should you have watched anyone's match? Probably. Did I know, but I probably should have. Just so I know what was going on. Just a good work. I mean, his character was real believable, too. He, he, he can work. Now, Sandman and ECW, or Paul, are going through a problem now because it's kind of a, a very public, thanks to the Internet, dispute about uh, pay-per-view payoffs. Now, Sandman is the one uh, bringing up uh, pay-per-view bonuses. Um, Sandman had apparently a $3,000 a week guarantee, not counting... Uh, pay-per-view bonus checks and he's uh, he had quit and then he came back you think he did you guys feel that someone was justified when you hear about something like that complaining about bonuses is someone like Sandman justified in complaining yeah I mean it, it, at some point we all started complaining right you know what I mean when you get behind you know and you you so far behind on 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 on, on paying us, everybody sort of complain. But at this point, are they slipping behind yet? Ninety eight. Are you behind in payments? Or are you still getting paid? I think we're still getting paid. Because the end doesn't come until two thousand one, so you're still three years away from. Yeah, that, so I think we're still getting paid then. Your idea to bring in Va oh, uh, uh, John Wayne? Yeah. How is he? He's cool. cool. Yeah. He's fine, yeah. Um, did you see the, f the film he made where he did, they, with, he did a porno with a, with a reattached penis? No, you didn't have to do that for research? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> that was years before. Did, what, you didn't have it in your video store. No, no. What did Marshnick say about Bob and anything? Um, you know what? I don't. <laughs> I do know that... Um, Venus reveals that his full package is intact thanks to Bobbitt, who cut the lights out at the right time. He was standing at attention, cocked, rocked, and ready to unload. There you go. For anyone that uh, the double entendre hitting you over the head with a bat doesn't uh, completely get you. The character of Gangrel comes from. There, like, there's a whole history to it. Like, there's a, there, there's like, Gangrel is something with the vampire folklore. I researched this. But did David bring this? Uh, no, or, no, 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 no. We, we, uh, we, we did it, and then it evolved into the Brood. I think he had the teeth gimmick, though. I think his teeth were obviously so he's a vampire. Yeah, yeah. but um, the goblet with the blood. What's, what's, what is in that? That was just all part of the character. Oh, just, just theatrical blood. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about Shane in an executive role. My friend, my friend, uh, a good friend of mine, Jimmy Monsies, was Shane's right-hand man in that department. In that position? Yes. In what ways is Shane like Vince, and in what ways is he Workaholic, different? man. Workaholic, a workaholic, just as much as his dad, uh, but definitely a lot more personable, a lot more approachable. 
Did they have a falling out? I don't know, man. I mean, I, 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 I don't know what the story is and what ha happened. Obviously, it looks like they had to. But, um, man, I, I loved Shane McMahon. Um, when, when I was going to go back there in 2002, they weren't using him in t on TV at all, which I, I could never understand. He personally met with me um, the morning that I was there. Uh, and was excited about you know me coming back to the company. Um, I just I, I I loved working with him, man. He was so good. When a new girl debuts, did the sharks in the locker room? The dreamers of the world start swelling. I guess he was maybe with Buell at this time, but the guys kind of start to smell blood in the water. What do you mean? Well, to hook up. No. Dude, you know what, honestly, when, as far as like, you know, the guys and the girls looking up like that, mm -hmm. that was so rare because she was like one of us. Right. The girls that came in to work were seen as family. Yeah. family. Yeah. You know, they were like one of us. Now, I mean, if they came in like Tammy, she was already with Chris. I mean, that's one thing. But I mean, you know, when somebody new shows up, everybody looking at her like just that she one of the boys. People cite this match as when those guys went from working just below the top of the card to top of the card guys. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Yeah, that's fair. Um, it was also reported that this match goes 10 minutes past the allotted time because it was so hot. And Bruce Pritchard is going nuts backstage, losing his mind, screaming to the ref on the earpiece. What can be done in a situation like this? Is it, 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 if the talent is not being cooperative for whatever reason, but you are on a timed schedule. They're going to get chewed out in the back. But m most importantly, whoever's match is going to be cut is going to be hot at these two guys. Right, because anytime they're taken, they're taken from somebody and else. And that's, that's really, you know, that's, you just don't do that. How did Bruce do in that role? He was good. He was good. I mean, Bruce, Bruce, Bruce could work under pressure. I mean, no doubt about it. He was good in that role. Remember Gang coming in? Yeah. So you want to pull these old friends? And again, another strange choice when you look at the, the roster. Just Probably. Old friend of Paul E's. Probably. Um, I work with Gang. I like him. Jack Victory, Tommy Rogers, uh, One Man Gang, Rod Price. Were these, gang, were these guys past their prime? I mean, were they relevant? Did you think that if the Philly crowd would buy it. Yeah. See, that's the thing about the, the ECW crowd in Philly. They would give you a chance. I think you could have been two foot. If you could get in the ring and do it, they'd give you a chance. You know what I mean? And Jack Victory, One Man Gang, they meant a lot to the company. And they did a lot for the company. He elects not to do like kind of like a farewell tour that Paulie wanted him to do before he left. He said he was hurt and he wanted to rest up right. from when he started in WCW. Is that a shitty thing to do? No, because he probably knew he was going to be doing jobs for the rest of <laughs> He probably knew he was going to be job boy number one. No, but don't you have to... Do the you, honest. You supposed to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you supposed to, yeah. But he probably didn't want to do it. 
I, if I had to guess, if I had, if I had to bet, I would bet and say that's what it was. Had nothing to do with resting up. Hell no. Up those injuries. I thought it was great. I did because, because see, Taz could do no wrong. He could do no wrong. And when he got in trouble and the cops came to get him, if you would have been there, you would have died. He was sitting there and the cops came in there, and the first thing Taz did, he jumped up, he said, somebody get Paulie. I'm going to jail. <laughs> he said, I'm going to jail. Get Paulie. Paulie couldn't help your ass then. Yeah. We, we 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 laughed about that shit forever. To this day, I still laugh about it. Cause he did it, and he know he did it. Well, I was gonna say, a lot of accusations get hurled at you guys. You know how you behave. I so, know, but he did it. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, don't you immediately dismiss stuff like this? No. <laughs> now, if it had been me, oh, I would have done it. If they would have uh -oh. said I did it, right. I, I would have been guilty, guilty as all, charged all, right. from the jump. Right. But it was Taylor, like, no. Showed his orange thing to her. Be like, yeah. yeah he's <laughs> <laughs> he what was the fallout from all this? Um, he obviously doesn't doesn't get uh, doesn't have to do do any time for it, right? So no. I guess this was all dropped and it, it, it went under the bridge. His behavior normally is he is he is he a, a flirt? Is he was he seen being disrespectful to women ever? Was there is the where there's smoke is there fire with this? Or? I guess I know why you think it's true and why you think it's funny, but to be fair, is he anyone that would do something like that? Did it and didn't get away with it, huh? Now we're starting to see some troubles for the company. Now you guys must be aware, if you don't have TV in New York for a time, right? The problems you can't get the slot he wants. They end up on MSG Network, kind of in a weird slot. Um, are you starting to sense that the end might be near? Yeah. What do you start to do? I mean, are you saving money? Are you calling friends and other promotions? What do you What do you do when something like this? Well, happens? see, you know, one of the things was. I wasn't turning down bookings from nobody. I mean, if they, if they were paying me, I was there. Paulie had told a lot of guys that you couldn't go work for other people. And even when... Independence? Yeah. He, he, was, he was telling a lot of guys, you know, you just can't work for nobody, period. You know, and I told him, I said, I said, here's my deal. If you want to pay me to sit at home, I said, I'll, I'll do it. But if I'm getting booked, I'm taking it. You know what I mean? A lot of them wouldn't go work. A lot of the other guys wouldn't do it. A lot of them wouldn't go. A lot of them wouldn't do it. They, they, they would almost have to get an approval from him before they would take a booking. Even when they see stuff like this start to happen? Yep. Wow. Yep. Good performer. JT was like a lap dog. I mean, if you would have put some white paint on his lips and told him to tap dance and holler, mammy, that would have been JT. Because he, he was just a yes boy to Paul E. Give a damn what it was. I'll do it. Sure will, yes sir. I'll do it. No, JT. Should he not have? When the boss asks him to do something? I didn't. I can't speak for nobody else. But I didn't. 
You think he was put in a ridiculous spot with the stuff he was asked to do? Some of that stuff. Well, JT was more like a kind of like an I work for food kind of guy. He didn't care what he did, just long as he long as he was on the show, he didn't care. That thing that Paulie had him doing with the FBI, mm -hmm. that was more like a joke. Right. And it was funny to Paulie. JD thought he was over with him. But he wasn't. He was getting paid to run like a goddamn fool. That's the thing he was being laughed at. Yeah. Right. Yeah, he was getting laughed, he was laugh, laughed at and not laughed with. Right. Yeah. And which would hurt you long term? Of course. Because you ain't worth a dime when you leave ECW. Because they want you to come in and do the same thing for a company, you know what I mean, that's drawing 200 people. And you don't want to do it. All right. And they want to pay you like that, too. And you don't, you don't want to do it. Do you have any personal heat with JT? Yeah. No. 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 Believe it or not, no. <laughs> if we're writing the history of ECW, which we're trying to do with the series, is he the guy that gets most of the credit for what ECW was? Or was it just the right combination of the right people at the right time? Was it circumstance? Or is he the brainchild? I'll go with the second answer. Combination? Yeah. Right people, right time. I don't remember Paulie getting in the ring doing a match. I don't remember. Maybe you got it in your notes, but I don't remember him doing a match. And a lot of stuff that happened in the ring, Paul, he didn't have nothing to do with. i give you an example. My music being played through my match. That started in ECW. That was not Paul Lee's idea, that was my idea. To keep it on? Yeah. I said, I want to be like a fight scene in the movie. It's just a long fight scene. Let the music keep playing. And when we did it, he was like, can you do it every night? I said, as long as you pay me, yeah. But he, um, he gets uh, hung on him, the, 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 the identity of the, uh, the guru, the cult leader. The, the, I don't know if it's Charles Manson, but if there was a, a kinder equivalent. I mean, I understand what you're saying. Did he make you want to do that and you didn't even know it? By giving you the freedom, by letting you be creative, by telling you, watch straight at him, Brooklyn. That's what I want you to be. And does that plant the seed to do the fight scene like a fight scene in a movie? No. Okay. Like I said, I mean, we had to have somebody. We had, we, we had to follow somebody. We had to have a, 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 a chief. He, happened, he just happened to be the chief. You know what I mean? And I give him credit for booking. Now, I mean, he has, he has the brain for that. But I can't give him but so much credit. Because he wasn't the one on the stage. He was the one behind. How about the job of, of uh, working the personalities? I mean, that's a big part of running yeah. any company. Yeah, he was good with that. Now, I mean, I, I, I'll give him credit. He can bring it out of you. If you wanted somebody to reach in there and find it and bring it out and put it on the surface, he could do that. Could ECW have been what it was with someone else at the helm? I don't think so. Not to the degree to where we took it. I don't think so. Were his ideas uh, uh, consistently good? I mean, sometimes you hear like bookers get burnt out and stuff. Was there ever a point where you turn and say, all right, maybe Paulie's past the shelf life here with this idea? No, it wasn't that. It, was, it, it, it got to a point where I knew we was, when we were coming to the end. When he just started booking shit, just 
you could, you could almost, you could literally get to the show and see him sitting over in the corner like this. By himself. Putting the show together. And I told somebody one night, I said, this shit ain't gonna last too much longer. We was in um, Panama City. And Paulie gave his long speech that night. And I told him, I said, this ain't gonna last. I said, y'all don't see the writing on the wall now. You, you, <laughs> Woo. I said, I know I'm not the only one. And that was when he was, he claimed he had gotten a deal from uh, out in LA. He was going out there to sign this deal for LA. And he was actually going out there to film that movie, Rollerball. Remember that? The, the movie Rollerball? Yeah. Yeah. You remember he was in it? No. I didn't see it. He was in it. And he told you he was going out to do a deal to get you guys to work the LA. He was doing it. He had, he had a TV LA. deal coming oh, out of LA. TV deal, okay. He was going out there. He said, he said, I'm not coming back until the deal is done. I said, Something right. I said, I'm telling y'all, something ain't right. And that was when he went out there to film that movie. I had to convince Vince to give them a contract. I saw the Hardys and we were at Vince's house and you know I mean again he didn't he didn't cons he only cared about the top top talent and I saw these kids and I literally had to talk Vince into giving them a contract. So obviously you know how I felt about them. They'd been around the company for a long time. What what makes you finally pull the trigger on them at this point? Just feeling that they're ready? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it, it's not a. I, I'm, I'm not going to sit there and really. I wasn't the guy that was that judged the wrestling ability. Okay, if they were on our show and they were in the ring, I would assume that everybody did their job, and so now they're in the ring because they deserve to be in the ring. But I thought that they had been around long enough, like in that jobber role you know, that it was now, you know, time to do something with them at the next level. We see often guys that there are big plans for, but ratings or crowds, something doesn't work. And then what did work about these guys that allowed them to go from the... Their look. They, they were cool. To this day, they still are. I mean, to this day, I don't, I don't know if there's anybody that's ever looked any cooler than Jeff Hardy. So they just really had that young, cool, youthful look. Why is Zamboni? Is this the, the Detroit thing because no, you're in? No, no, because see, here, here's the thing that you never see anymore, Sean. We, we sat there every week and tried to give the audience something they had never seen before. No, no matter what it was, we, listen, it's easy to be a writer and sit there and rehash wrestling angles because they've all been done. It's so easy to steal off of what's been done in the past. We made a concerted effort to show them something they had never seen before. So, you know, a wrestler, perfect for Austin, driving the Zamboni into the arena. We knew nobody's ever seen this before. Right. Um, he was able to manipulate it. Did he have well, to? Well, no. Get I some remember training? he took down a couple of trusses. I mean, uh -huh. <laughs> I remember on the on the way to the ring, he took down quite a bit of stuff in the back. But was the only? I mean, I guess he was shown a, a couple of hours before the show how to drive a zamboni. That's it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. um, here's another classic. Vince Austin will play for the next thirty years in highlight clips. Um, who's who's the MVP of that feud? If you have to give one. Wow. Everyone contributes, but there's one MVP that goes out at the end of the Super Bowl. I think it was Vince. I really do. He, 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 he gave Austin everything. You know, as a performer, Vince gave Austin everything for Austin to get himself over.
when we were talking before and we said, did you ask the question? 1998, first thing that comes to mind in wrestling, everybody got asked. A lot of people said the bedpan. So take me inside the creation of this, uh, this vignette. Here's the thing, man. It's like, see, this is what I get upset with. And Mr. Sacco debuts here, too. I, I wish that was my this idea. It wasn't. Way. Here's what I get upset with. Okay, everybody, listen, there are people that for whatever reason uh, want to take credit away from me. You, you, Vince was an editor. The talent was so great, this and that. So they just want to strip me of everything. He, 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 here's what people don't understand. And here's where the pressure came in. The talent was so great. It was an all-star lineup from top to bottom, okay? Somebody had to give them material on a weekly basis. What, what I compare it to is, how, how does a guy like Robert De Niro, uh, you know, make a Goodfellas or make a Godfather 2 or make a Raging Bull and make a Rocky and Bullwinkle? Because it's the writing. So the pressure came from these guys were so good, <clears throat> somebody had to feed them the material on a weekly basis. So just the idea in the head of knowing if we put Austin and Vince in a hospital room, okay, just put them in that setting, we know that they're going to do the rest but somebody's got to put them in the setting. Somebody's got to come up with that material to give them. And that's the thing with us, you know, <clears throat> we never wanted, we, we, we didn't even dream of ever, uh, you know, making the talent look bad. I, I, I remember literally a month ago, I was watching a match and it was Bray Wyatt and it was Luke and Luke was in the match against uh, Roman Reigns. And I remember, uh, you know, uh, Dean Ambrose is at the announce desk, and Dean Ambrose um, flails one of those rolly nice announce uh, chairs to Bray Wyatt. So now, now um, Ambrose is at the announce desk. Bray Wyatt is sitting on the outside in an, in an announce's chair watching the match, okay? Right in front of Bray Wyatt's face, okay, Roman Reigns pins Luke Harper one, two, three. Bray Wyatt never leaves the chair, okay? You've just totally buried that character, Bray. Never in a million years would that guy have sat there and watched a pinfall. So we were, every character we wrote for, we put ourselves in their boots. Steve Austin would not do the same thing that The Rock would do under the same circumstances. Mm -hmm. Neither would have Vince McMahon, neither would have Shawn Michaels. We stayed true to every single character. Seth, Seth Rollins, what, one week he's running away, the next week he's fighting Dean Ambrose by himself because he doesn't need anybody. Th there is absolutely no consistency. no consistency whatsoever. That's why nobody is getting over. Is you part, had consistency here. Is part of this the fault of the talent who should know better? They're living in this character day in and day out. So if, if something gets past the writers, can't they go, it, it, last week you had me... The, he, he, here's the difference. They know better. They're afraid of losing their okay. spots. Right. Steve Austin, if something stunk... He would say something because his attitude was, well, go ahead and try to replace me. Let's see how that works right. out for you. You see what I'm saying? They, they were good enough that they had to come. Sean, I, 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 I saw Sean Michaels tell Vince McMahon, F you, right to his face. I sat there and I witnessed it because Sean was, okay, replace me with who? The, the problem today is the talent today is working just as hard as the talent did back here. The problem is the writing is not as good. And the talent is afraid to say anything in fear of losing their spot. That's why you get the product that you get on TV. Back, back in this day, we wanted people to speak up. It was a group effort. If you could come up with something that was better, tell us and we'll do it. So Steve could come over and say... Absolutely. And you guys would work it out. And Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Oh man, you just, 
they were just nuts. I mean, they were. They, I, I love these guys. I mean, I really did. I enjoyed working with them, but they were like they were on the verge of uncontrollable. I think they told us that there was a uh, a cross promotional deal that was in place with the record company and WWE where they'd get some promotion for the songs or the videos or something and, and WWE wasn't making good on it and that's why they left. True, not true, or I, I, unaware. I, 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 yeah, I would not know. First of all, do you know how bad Axel's liver problems were? I mean, is that apparent to you guys I in the locker really room did. before you work with somebody? No. And um, exploiting one's own health problems for a TV angle? Of course. Fair game? Yeah. Show must go on? Yeah. So if you were, let's say you had some kind of internal injury, you might stir it up a little bit to get a little bit of blood to come out of the mouth maybe for TV. Either that or you good, you gig. Yeah. You gig, okay, well, that's true, right. right on you the never bottom, used a blade, did you? Uh, never. Right on the bottom lip. Just gig. Uh, that looks like it's coming out of You believe mouth. ever. Right. What's the, uh, I've discussed this with a few people, I guess you're as good as any to ask. Uh, the secrets, the uh, tips, the suggestions for the proper gig to get maximum effect with minimal damage is what? I don't know how careful you were about getting maximum effect from minimal damage, <laughs> but, if, but if one were a baby one, face two, and, were, and didn't, didn't want that, what, what's the key? To go this way instead of this way. Okay, don't do the Abbey. Right. Or the Jack. Yeah. Why? Because it falls into the natural. It goes against the grain. Oh, right. And you end up looking like this. Right. Whereas you look at somebody, think somebody got flair. Right. Flair done gave it a million times. Right. But he always go that way. Right. And I mean, you can see the scar tissue. But it don't look as bad as what mine does, you know what I mean? Because I, I, I went against it. I went that way. I mean, I went that way. Are you opening the same ones occasionally if you have a few shots Sometimes. On, on the same weekend? You don't Sometimes. Um, you always did yourself? Or did you? I think I let somebody do it one time. Why? I didn't know how to do it. Oh. For the first time? Yeah. yeah you hear that sometimes. Though. Yeah. And then... You weren't dressed like a bus driver, were you? No, you no. Somebody to cut your head. <laughs> I think somebody did me one time, and then I started doing it my own. And I just got hooked. Got hooked. I, I want to do it. I want to. I want to get. I want. Just because of the pop it got. Yeah, from the crowd? yeah. You know what I mean? Just like I want to get color. Probably. Yeah, Jack, go ahead. What the fuck happened? Good for TV. <laughs> Um, taking care of your gig, where would you, where would you hide yours, first of all? Uh, did you do the finger, the wrist, what would you? <coughs> I would take mine to, my, to the inside of my wrist. Had you never accidentally, and any wrestler really, accidentally cut... Now I snagged Axel one time. Oh, you told me you shot him in and sliced and, his and, finger and, off, and, right? And it, and it caught him in the thumb, yeah. and I'm going to tow his thumb off. But, uh, I would put like about four or five of them, just in case one fell off. Four or five gigs? Yeah. <laughs> because I mean, you, you could lose one. You could lose one. <laughs> if, if, you, if, if you dropped it, then what you gonna do? You pull out one of the other four, I guess. So I would put it in different places, but it'd be like on, it'd be on my wrist, but in different uh -huh. spots. And I have like at least four. Like Wolverine. Yeah, if I was gonna get it early, I'll have it in my hand already. When you came out? When I came in the ring. Oh. It'd be clamped between my fingers. Just <laughs> When's the right time to get color? Do you know like when in the match? Like uh, it just depends when when the, when the spot is there. Right. You know, if it's a stabbing, then you. Right. It, it's not really. A, it, it, it's not like a good time. 
in the ring to do it other than when it's time right. to do it. Uh, okay. You come, uh, well, first the Zamboni, now the Corvette. Again, we're sending things in. The budget is limitless. The, you're riding high on ratings. So if you go, I need a Corvette, you have a Corvette to destroy. Mm -hmm. How did how, did they get a Corvette that's not working? Are they destroying a new Corvette? Well, it wasn't a new Corvette. It was a used Corvette, but it was a... It was a newer a, model yeah, Corvette. Yeah, it was a working Corvette. Yeah. Here, here's the thing too, you know, Sean, that hey, we're going to get a little bit off topic here, but I have to explain this to you because this is what I love. Okay, I, I also get the well, Vince, if you were so great, um, if you were so great, and Vince wasn't the filter in all this, then why didn't you achieve those same numbers at TNA? And I try to educate those people and explain to them how important budget is. And that's why when people say, what, where, where's the best place you work? WWE, without a doubt, because we could do anything, and we know that they'd produce it. There were no limitations whatsoever. My favorite story is, when I was over at TNA, remember Tara? Yeah. And Tara had the spider? Mm -hmm. Well, Tara had the spider, and she had the spider for a couple of weeks. Well, then the handler of the spider got paid $200 to come to Orlando with the spider. After about four weeks, TNA could not afford to pay the $200 for the handler of the spider. That's what I'm talking about. So when you go from the WWE where you can get a rocket launcher, you can get a Corvette, it doesn't matter. You know, you, television needs to be a spectacle. It needs to be spectacular. It's those big things that people are always going to talk about. When you go from that to a company that's, you know, nickel and diming and just trying to get along, when you're sitting down to write the show, that you, that's in your head. Like you're writing, you're knowing, no, they can't do that. No, they can't do that. No, we can't afford that. No, we can't do this. And it, it limits you as a writer. At the WWE, there are absolutely no limitations. Right. Uh, throughout the years, you had a hand in repackaging a lot of guys and trying different things and to more serious characters than maybe they had been before in those years when things were weird and we talked about the goon and whatnot. Um, this seems like the opposite. You've got Owen, who was a serious wrestler, and he becomes the Blue Blazer. How and why? Well, Owen was the Blue Blazer. Before. Well, he was the Blue yeah. Blazer first. I, I, I could tell you honestly, man, going back and watching these shows now, even me as the writer, I could not, I, 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 I couldn't, the, the badass character that we tried to make on playing off of Brett Laff, mm -hmm. trying to play off reality, I never could take him seriously as that badass character. Maybe it's because when you knew Owen, you just knew that wasn't him, and it was really hard to believe. But even when I go back and I watch these shows now and the feud with Triple H and stuff, I'm watching them and I'm like, I, I, I will never buy that Owen is a tough guy. Now, the Blue Blazer, and you know, we turned it into a little bit of a comedy gimmick, that's who Owen was in the back. You know, he was always pranking everybody. He was always smiling. He was always laughing. I think the highlight of his day was, you know, just who are we going to rib today? Like, that's who Owen was. So, you know, to me, the blue blazer was much more fitting and believable to him than the badass Owen Hart. Why does it take so long to get The Rock out of that? Um, he's, he's kind of broken out many months before this, um, just waiting for a spot to clear at the top. Why? Well, I, 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 think, um, I think the story was like still working. And like it was, it was a kind of thing like everybody knew it was coming. 
So like, I didn't think we really, really needed to force it. And then again, you're also going to have the issue of, well, when Rock is out of that group, what's going to happen to the group? You know what I mean? It, it's not going to be the same without Rock in it. So we probably tried to milk it as long as we could. I want to take you back to something you talked about, you know, when you worked with Corny and there are certain cities in the United States mm. that still, all these years after civil rights, <laughs> um, it's very, it would be very easy for you to push certain buttons in, right. in certain places. By ECW's time, had people become desensitized to that or would people still show up wanting to throw you around a tree in cities in Alabama? Yeah. You could still play that card to inc you could. incite people. You could, but I, I, I had an agreement that I didn't want to do that anymore. With Paul? Yeah. When I came in the door, I was like, one of, one of the things I don't want to do is the race card. I don't want to do it no more. And he agreed. Could I have gotten it, done and got away with it? Easy. Did that stuff show up even though you weren't playing the card in certain places? I don't want to pick on Alabama. In certain cities... With ECW, Where not really. Where you hear really. that stuff, no. Not really. Okay. I mean, dude, we was like a, we was like a cult. Right. So the kids that were coming wanted to see you. Right. They didn't hate you like that. I mean, it's like if you had ECW and Smoky Mountain in the same city on the same night, you would probably get ECW fans and Smoky Mountain fans. Two different, yeah. You know what I mean? It's two totally different crowds. Mm -hmm. Totally different. Um, Robert Gibson works here. Again, we're going to go on that. Tommy Rogers, Robert Gibson coming in. What's your reaction when you hear you're going to get one half of the Rock and Roll Express? I don't think the fans was ready for that. I mean, as far as him being over, he had, he had, he had already been past his over to overtime, you know what I mean? Him and Ricky, when they came, I, I remember when they came. And uh, they were just too far gone. Was it ever the intention to get a, a pop as big as they used to, especially with ECW fans? Like, did Paul think he was going to get those guys over? No. <laughs> so it was almost like the rib was on them a little <laughs> bit. That's how I interpret it. <laughs> yeah. Bring your bandanas, guys. <laughs> he, put, he put Ricky in a match with me. And I hear Ricky with something. Ricky said, what the fuck? <laughs> it was at the arena. I remember this to that day. I hear Ricky with a frying pan or something. Ricky said, what the fuck? <laughs> They weren't ready for that. <laughs> no. <laughs> How's this developed? Something That's you come up with? Vince. Oh. Absolutely. Vince has this thing, man, and everybody knows this. It's uh, folklore in the wrestling bit he lo he loves potty humor man I, I don't know what it is about the guy but you know poop and duty and pee in your pants he he farting he just he gets off on this stuff that was 100 percent his idea we talked about vince's ego before but he's ego less enough to be seen with the piss running down well you know what because back in the day look at it he did whatever was best for business. Like, that was a shoot. If it was best for business, he did it. They say that today, but they don't do what's best for business. They just say it. Right. On October 19th at Heat at the Bradley Center, Motley Crue parties with DX and performs. Is this your idea to get Crue involved? No. Mm -mm. I think I think they had a new record coming out, and they probably contacted us. Did a deal so with WWE, like, at the... Record company level, like the record company to WWE. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And I remember, I can remember that. Um, the thing I remember most about that was like uh, Sean Waltman 
was a huge Motley Crue mark, and like that was the greatest day of his life. And it made me happy that he was able to experience that, but I'll never forget, I mean, he was like a, like a kid in a candy store that day. What do you think of the, the, the pairing as a comedy theme? They'll never be any better. Who's going to be better than that? For something like this, how much is written and how much are their ad libs? You're, you're, Did you give them that freedom? You, you, oh, of course. You're giving them an outline. You're giving them an outline. We need to hit this. We need to cover that. But they're filling in the blanks. You can't see that. That's the thing. Like you know, you you watch the show today, and you could see everybody has a script and it's memorized. You 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 don't you don't write for Mick Foley here and Al Snow what to say. You'd have to be an idiot. So you'd give them the framework of this is what we need to be accomplished, and then they would go out and do it. We there have, was not a song for you on there. I know. Why? You guys, for you, I mean, your music was, I mean, that was a very well, iconic. For, for one, they couldn't, they, of course, they couldn't get the original version. That's why right, killer. Right. And um, why didn't he have somebody else to play? I, yeah. I, I, that I don't know. You didn't ask at the time? I didn't, I really could care less. Right. <laughs> um, Harry Slash? Did the in-house music for you guys? Remember? I remember him. Interactions with him? Were you? He was alright. Did you? Did he do your? Any of your music at any point? No, I don't think. Okay. Who was he? Where the hell did he come from? Some boy out of New York. Friend of Paul's? Yep. There was a point in time when Nash Bridges came around. I don't know if it was this time. I remember I was there. You know, I, I have a Jean Claude Van Damme movie being offered. Could it this, be that? No, it wasn't. It was a Nash Bridges thing. But okay. I, re I remember, um, I remember when Nash Bridges came along, and Steve was in Nash Bridges, and Steve, you know, got the taste of. Hollywood and acting and remember Steve had had suffered some tough injuries you know mm -hmm. so now all of a sudden he's in demand he's making a lot of money acting and I remember there was a point in time where he wanted to go down that road and he was trying to get out of his WWE contract and and I guarantee you that's what that was about because I specifically remember a meeting and Vince not being happy and I think it was when Austin was just getting a taste of you know what, I might be able to, be, to make you know, just as much money doing something that's going to have less of, a, of an effect on my body. Was anything that you were planning for him, uh, did it justify his being concerned? I don't think so. And like the part about like, you know, Vince felt he needed to home, I, I, don't, I, 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 don't, I don't remember or I, I don't think any of that is true. Talk about Jake coming in for the one shot and all the problems he has getting the shows. Just poor planning on his part? I think. Did you hang with Jake at all? I think I did. I think you might have. <laughs> Good fit for the ECW locker room. I'll ask I all think the I did, that's all I'm saying. Ask all the obvious questions. <laughs> well, take me to this night. You remember the night when he was... He, didn't show up, or he was late showing yeah. up. Yeah. Is there chaos? Well, of course. Where the fuck is Jay? Yeah. So, all right, so he gets there. Uh, do you know if there was a backup plan? What, what if he... That I don't know. That'd be something, right? Obviously, it's got to be a real consideration that he may not show, so somebody... I think, I think they stretched it out as much as they could to get him there. 
the plan was originally for it to be Vader, we hear, and that falls through. I heard that. I don't know what happened. So talk about Jake being in, coming to ECW. Jake was for fine. Mm -hmm. Good worker. Yeah. Any yeah. same act? Any same uh, hobbies? Let me tell you something. Did you hang with, with Jake? I mean, I'm joking with you, but did you? I'm going to tell you something. We did New Orleans. Jake came down. I didn't know Jake got hot at the time. So me and Jake walking down the hall. Paul Lee turns the corner. Run right into us. He said, oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Jack, you know we got a show tomorrow, right? I said, yeah, why? He said, oh, Lord. <laughs> that was it. That was, I found out why later. Later on. But, dude, I was just like, oh, man, come on, man. But he did. He's like, he just, he just shook his head. Oh, Lord. Paulie into UFC? Was he aware of it at the time? I mean, it's starting. He was he was into shitting on it. Oh, into shitting on it? Yeah, because oh. I mean, if you, if you remember now, they brought in a dude from a, a, a UFC for for Taz. Paul Marlins. This guy Varlins. like this guy like six foot fifteen. Varlins, right? Yeah. And Taz choked him right out of the middle of the ring. So that's Paulie's statement on yeah. UFC. Yeah. Why'd you guys add a hardcore title? Is this a nod to ECW? This is just another thing that, man, there's so many things about wrestling that people just don't want to freaking admit. Um, you watch the product today, there are wrestling matches that go through two commercial breaks. Mm -hmm. Okay. If I'm not a wrestling fan, I'm not watching that. The reason for the, the, um, the, reason for the amount of gimmick matches mm -hmm. is designed for the casual fan. Okay. If I'm not a wrestling fan, I'm not going to watch wrestling. However, if I'm flipping through the channels and there's a ladder in the ring or there's a cage up or there's a couple of garbage pails in the ring, anything that is going to stop me dead in my tracks, we're going to book that over a wrestling match. That's going to get the casual audience. That's why there were pole matches. Mm -hmm. You know that. That's why there were spectacles because I might not care about wrestling, but whoa, wait a minute! That lunatic's climbing up a ladder, and the other guy's hitting him with a garbage pan to give them the spectacle that would draw them into it. That wasn't just a straightforward two guys in a ring wrestling that I'm going to click right by. Right. So that that that's really where the hardcore matches came from. The belt had a very cool design. It was like kind of cracked and pieced together. Who does that aspect of work for the company? That if would have been a Richie. Richie Curtis. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Are you guys talk? Is this is this audible now? If I walk through an ECW locker room, are are guys belly aching to each other? Are they complaining? Yeah. Are they saying it's time to go? It really wasn't a matter of saying it was time to go. They were saying it's, that is about to crash and burn. You know what I mean? Because a, a, a lot of guys didn't have anywhere else to go. You know, so. To say, yeah, it's time to go, that might have been the right statement to say, but that's not what a lot of them could have done because they didn't have anywhere else to go.
Is Paul E. addressing any of these concerns with anybody? He's making excuses. Right. He's buying time. He's going to L.A. to yeah. do that TV deal, yeah. right? Reaction from Vince? Well, you know, they had a, they had a, yes. My favorite, one of my favorite things in the world was that, and I'm sure you're coming up on it soon, but you don't even think about like having a cigarette. I'm talking about, forget about even lighting it up. Don't, don't even think about having a cigarette like within a mile radius of Vince. Oh. He like cigarette smoking like four get about it. I mean, you wouldn't even dream about it. I mean, he used to get Pat on all the time. He used to get on Patterson all the time because Pat used to smoke. Oh, so yeah. He used to get Pat, but Pat would never smoke around them, but just Pat's uh, cigarette breath was, was enough to drive Vince crazy. But I'll never forget, man, you know, here was Jesse. He was now the, the mayor of, of uh, Minnesota, governor of governor. Minnesota. We brought him on to a show. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the entire night backstage, he had a cigar this big blowing the smoke directly in Vince's face. I mean, just like, you know, all those years and I'm the governor now and like, what are you going to do about it? And just the look on the look on his on Ventura's face was just absolutely priceless. Is Vince selling? No, he wasn't selling, but yeah. he didn't say anything either. He didn't say anything. Wow. He let the governor smoke. Yeah. Um, once he's elected, the wheels have to start turning over at Titan Tower. How to, like, whatever problems they had before, it's too big now not to put aside. What are early plans? There, there, there really are, because, again, that, that would have been something that would have been going on on Vince's end. And then, and then basically, we would have got the call that, oh, we got Jesse and he's going to be on this show. So, I mean, there, there, there weren't any plans in motion until we knew that we had him. Doing like a bitch. So he wasn't able to take punishment no. that, that he was... <laughs> no. That's like smacking a woman outside of here, man. Come on. <laughs> he supposedly hurt... Uh, uh, he was hurt by balls. Was balls reckless with stuff, chair shots? Depending on who you was. Oh, so if he didn't like you... You get it. Mm. Or if somebody else didn't like you and asked him to do it, you get it. Interesting. He never hit me with a chair. No, sir. <laughs> See, I'd always heard what a nice guy, I mean, I've, I've met him, and he, was, he was nice when I worked with him, but in ECW, you always heard like he was one of the really nice guys. At the, no, he was a good guy, guy. Don't, don't get me wrong, yeah. but I'm just saying, he would get you. Make it look like an accident? Yeah. Apologize? If your number was up, your number was up, he'd get you. Knock the shit out, you would, <laughs> I'm serious. That was the greatest piece of wrestling writing in history of wrestling. Go ahead. Ed and I had worked so long on this storyline, and it was it was so thorough, and it was so concise, and it was a long, drawn-out plan. And I'll never forget that night in the arena. You knew it worked because the second Rock did it, like you could you could hear a pin drop in the house. Nobody saw it coming whatsoever. And here's the funny thing, along the way, if you remember, Rock drops the people's elbow on Vince. But keep in mind, they're in cahoots this whole time. But like Ed and I looked at each other, we're like, it's an elbow. Right. But the, like the people's elbow was so over that when Rock did it, it was like, oh, oh. Right. But like me and Ed were like, 
it, it's an elbow. He'll be able to take it. Exactly. Yeah. He'll be, so, like, it worked that they were still working. But the fact that he dropped the people, like, so that's why when he did the turn, they, they, they couldn't believe right. it. It wouldn't be a tombstone. It wouldn't be able to work. But and then, but then, yeah. like, after three seconds, when, when it sunk in, it, 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 that, was, that was the best thing I, I ever did in my entire career. Um, was The Rock a better healer, Babyface? I, I mean, it's, that's such a hard question when you because I don't consider him either a heel or a baby piece. I consider him the rock. See, I mean, when, when we wrote the TV, and here's what's different today, too. We didn't care if they booed you, and we, we didn't care if they cheered you. We cared if they, if they reacted to you. That's all we cared about. It's, if they want to cheer you, great. If they want to boo you, cheer. As long as they're reacting to mm. you, that's the important thing. So that's why when you say that, like immediately, I don't think of Rock as a baby face or a heel. I think of him as a as, as the Rock, because depending on who's looking at him, you could either cheer him or you could either boo him. Was he at his best being cheered or booed? Being cheered. Is it true that he doesn't like this angle? If he doesn't like the angle, I mean, it, that's news to me because he didn't, he, he did not tell me he did not like the angle. Who came up with the idea of the fall? I think it was me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you propose this thing? It's got to be delicate because it does touch on a personal life issue with the person. It might not be the only time you've done this where you take some element of someone's, an uncomfortable element of a person's life and turn it into an angle. Do you have to have a delicate discussion? You do have to have a delicate discussion, but you're also, you're also hoping that maybe it's a wake-up call. You know what I'm saying? That maybe if you face you know, reality and face the facts and now like you, you're, you're seeing it sober, that maybe like that's a wake up call to you, even if you even if you say oh my god other other people are noticing you know what i'm saying so a, a lot of times it was that too like i i remember once with road dog you know he was he was dealing a lot with um with drugs and stuff at the uh, at the time um but then he had become like clean and sober and i wanted him to cut a promo on that to basically hold him responsible for staying clean and sober. You see, once you go out in front of the people and say, well, I had a problem, but I'm clean and this and that, now you may think twice before you go and screw up again because I just went on national league TV and, and, and said I was clean and sober. And I know he had an issue with it and we wound up not doing it. But, you know, that's how I would handle it. I mean, listen, this is the reality of the situation. You know, we can discuss it, we can handle it, but in the back of my mind, I was hoping it was. I, listen, I, I'll be honest, I, I've never told this story, like, publicly, and I don't know if it was before this, or I don't know if it was after it, but I'll never forget this as long as I live, because it, it might have been one of the worst things I've, I've ever seen in my life, but I remember I was at an airport one day, one morning, very early in the morning, you know, we, we, we just had a show and we were leaving town, and I remember, man, seeing Animal wheeling Hawk uh, through, the, um, through the airport in a wheelchair, and he was totally out and foaming at the mouth. And I remember seeing this, and like I was, I, I knew like this, this is not going to turn out good. Now, I, I, to be honest with you, I'm almost certain this was before that mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have seen something like that and then did done this angle. Absolutely okay. not. I mean, and probably I was probably so naive at the time because I never listen. I never took drugs. I never drank. I never did anything like mm -hmm. that. I was probably so naive at the time that I didn't realize the issues he were have he was having was as serious as they right. were. That's how naive I was. But um, I'll never forget. I'll never forget that sight. Man, you, you know, you talk about what's best for business. I'll, I'll never forget this. This was after WrestleMania, 
and Vince and Sean did not make up after that WrestleMania match, okay? So Sean went away, you know, took care of his back injury and all that, and I remember, you know, proposing to Vince, we need to bring Sean back on TV, and it was probably this. And uh, because it was what was best for business. Right. And even though I could have told you firsthand that, yes, at times he was an absolute pain in the backside to work with, you still sucked it up because he was that good and it was best for business. So I remember we called him. He agreed to come back to TV. Something happened where, like, there were two days of television, I, I believe. I can't remember exactly, but, like, there were two days of television. One day, Sean was not booked for. He was booked for the second day. Mm -hmm. um, there was a mistake made in travel, whatever the case may be. They flew him in the first day. He was at the building. And then somebody told him he wasn't on the show. I remember him coming after me. And I mean literally threatening me and like cut a scathing promo on me. And I remember I went to Vince and I said, bro, I said, you need to do something about Sean. Because, I mean, he really like, I was shaken. I mean, it was like no wrestler had ever really spoken to me before or anything like that. And it was like a, there was a threat and I was shaking, and I'm like, bro, you need to do something. And I remember Vince turned around to me. He goes, I need to do something. You were the one that talked me into bringing him back. He goes, you do something. You know what I'm saying? So, and he was right, because I went to bat for Sean. So, like, just based on that experience, obviously wounds hadn't healed, yeah. and that's probably why. This is an extreme example. I mean, this is going as far away from the wrestling ring as you can. Is this you and uh, and Ed? Yeah. What were the specifics, though? Can we um, yeah, it memory? is um, footage airs of Undertaker carrying Austin into the embalming room of a mortuary. Paul Bearer puts on plastic gloves and the plastic gown in preparation. Austin's shown lying on the table, shirt cut open, pair of scissors lying on his chest. Undertaker begins chanting in tongues, slowly raises a large dagger-like knife. Just as he's about to lower the knife, Kane barges in. Uh, they brawled. Bearer picked up the scissors and attempted to stick them into Austin. Austin wakes up and stops him in the fall, the four brawl until the footage gets that cut. That sounds like a good Batman 66 episode, doesn't the, it? The, the shark repellent almost yeah, came exactly. out. Exactly, right man. Um, where's the shot? What do you mean? Where, where do you shoot? Where's the mortuary? We probably went to a mortuary. Oh, we, really? I, absolutely. No <laughs> doubt. Of, there's no doubt in my mind that's where we shot it. You got to understand, you, we're so hot that, like, wh whatever we want to use, whatever we want to do with the WWE, you're going to have exposure, you're going to be on TV, blah, blah, blah. There were no, we, we were there. I mean, I don't remember anybody. There's no that element was. of. Um, uh, second guess uh, that maybe it's disrespectful to who the dead the dead what do they care come on man this is classic TV you sad to see him go no. Wasn't well liked by the locker room? No, I mean, it was cool. I just, I didn't give a shit if he stayed away. I'm just being honest. Were you, were you friendly with no one there? <laughs> Did you have a bond with anyone that was like, oh, no. it that sucks that he's gone. <laughs> no. Brian made the locker room a happy place. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> if it was time for you to go, it's time for you to go. <laughs> See you. Did it fool the crowd? Yeah. Because Paulie ran out and... Yeah, they thought his neck was broke. It was all set up. Fucking neck was broke. What do you think about Sabu? It's, it's told... It's talked about, I should say, that the amount of chances he's taken um, and the things he's done 
for the business, for ECW. The toll it's, it's taken on him doesn't equate with what he's left with now, that he should have made more money, should have been more of an icon. you agree with that sentiment? I would. You was going to want with him? Yeah. <laughs> it seems there's more below the surface every time I ask you, no. these, I ask you these questions. <laughs> no, no, me and Sabu were cool. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we were cool. Should he have made more money? We all should have. Just because, like, a lot of the highlight reel stuff, and you could put yourself in this category too, a lot of the ECW highlight reel was made up of Sabu stuff right. and New Jack stuff. Right. That's not anything that sits badly with you today? Hmm. What do you think of her when she first comes into the company? Is, is, is she ever someone that you think could inherit this? Uh, oh, business-wise? Yes, no, yes. No, no. Uh-uh, no, no. Mm -mm. Did she originally want to be on-air talent? Did she want to run the WWE? V v Vince's plan was the same that it was with Shane. You know, he, he taught the kids, like, every aspect of the business. He would literally put them in every department, marketing, you know, PR, uh, creative. I mean, that, that's what he did with Shane. He was going to do the same thing with Stephanie. Right. Um, how, how do you think she's done as head of creative? I think that was the biggest mistake that Vince McMahon made in the history of the company. I don't think he's recovered from it, and I think it has a lot to do with them being in the spot that they're in today. She, listen, man, we, we, we all know ourselves. Uh, you know, we're good at some things. We're not so good at some things. I was a guy that I could write the show and I could produce the talent, okay? I knew what I was good at. I never, I never tried to do anything else because I, 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 I firmly believe when we try to be something we're not, that's when we get ourselves in trouble, okay? Like, I worked with an Eric Bischoff. Eric Bischoff is a phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal businessman. I suck at business. I've put some of my own businesses out of business. I'm horrible. Can Eric Bischoff write a television show? No, he can't. He thinks he can, but he can't. There are, there, there are things we can do. You cannot just put somebody as head of creative if they're not creative and if that's not their background. And the problem was... Once Vince put Stephanie in that spot, there was no turning back because it was his daughter. It was his flesh and blood. He's not going to leave egg on her face. He's not going to say my daughter failed. He's not going to do that. So immediately by putting her in that position, there was no turning back. You can look at ratings since she's been in that spot. If it were anybody else, that, th that spot would have been turned over at least five times by now. But he, he cannot do that to his own daughter, and I felt that was a huge mistake. If called back today, could you work for Stephanie no. McMahon? No, that's, that's why I wound up not going there in 2002. It was explained to me that Shane McMahon was really behind me going back, and it was explained to me by one of the writers that was working there at the time. It just so happened when I met with the, uh, with the um, writers the day that, that I was there, all the writers are there, Stephanie McMahon is not there. Next thing I know, I'm being summoned into another room, and Stephanie's on the speakerphone. Now keep in mind, I had left the company three years ago. I had no contact with anybody or anything. Stephanie on the speakerphone starts literally talking down to me like I'm a 12-year-old kid. Saying like? Ju ju just talking to me with disrespect. We, we do this now, we do that, we don't do this anymore, blah, blah, blah. The minute she hung up the phone, I knew this is not going to work 
out. And, and Vince called me the next morning and basically said, Vince, I don't think this is going to work out. Because the fact of the matter is, he knew what I did and he knew what I was capable of. And the notion of me working under Stephanie creatively was insanity. But again, that was his daughter. He wasn't going to leave egg on her. He was not going to replace Vince Russo. With, with, that was not going to happen. Right. So he had no other choice. You know, it's, it's getting to know the personality of the guys in the back. And Mark Henry. Now, I was going to say, Mark. Yeah, he's a marshmallow, man. He's a, just a big marshmallow. And just the whole idea of him falling for China, I mean, it, you know, we, we just knew it would be great. China was great in the role. Are you it, guys it, laughing all the time? We're laughing all the time. It, it, you know, can I tell you something? It's so sad to, like, talk about this stuff and then, like, know what's going to be on on Monday. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm being serious. It's like, can, can somebody explain to me why this can't be happening today? I, 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 hear, I hear Triple H, it's a different time. It's a different time. It's a di okay, it's a different time, so you can't write good TV. No, it's, it's because it's edgy and they're beholden to Wall Street and shareholders who might be very conservative. And, and that's really who's writing wrestling now are the shareholders. And so we can't. We can't risk anyone Googling China so, and seeing something and going to their daddy, who's CEO of Wells Fargo, who was maybe going to invest in WWE the next day and going, that's the girl that's going to be on the show that we're going to watch. And him going, okay, we have to reconsider the investment of 500,000 shares we were going to make tomorrow. That's what it's about. Come on. Just how far can we go with the, the no. evil? Uh, yeah, ju just, just again, what have we not seen on a wrestling show? Right. I mean, really, that's what, what have we not seen? What can, what can be a spectacle? You know, hit him on that big symbol. I mean, that's a spectacle. That's what I wanted to say. When you, and we saw what was the result, but was there growth from what you pitched up to that? Like, what are you seeing in your vision with Ed when you come up with the idea? Is it what we finally saw? It is because we know we can make it as large as possible and they'll pull it off. So we shoot for the moon because we know we've got that crew and that staff and that talent behind us that will make it happen. And Steve is behind it from the first mm -hmm. pitch, no. I, 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 think, I, I think he had a little problem with that at the time because it was a big baby face thing. You know, him, him saving Stephanie was, I, I think that took some convincing. But I mean, at the end of the day, if Steve didn't want to do something, he wouldn't, he wouldn't well, have done right. it. So he went along with it. Did you expect the controversy that it got? No. I, 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 or did you welcome it anyway? Because it's... Well, listen, I'm a Christian guy now. I wasn't then. then. I yeah. wasn't then. So like now I look at it, I'm like, oh my God, are you going to hell or what? I mean, I, but then it was like, honestly, I didn't, I didn't look at it as any, any big deal. What about internal reaction? Anyone in the company bothered by it now? I think if it like I think it would have been a huge difference if it was a cross, but it wasn't a cross. You know, Taker had a symbol, it was Taker's symbol. And I know we were careful to really say that, you know, mm -hmm. the Undertaker's symbol more than once. Obviously, it's getting a little goofy now. Um, working with outsiders, other athletes, <clears throat> mainstream athletes that come into a locker room, uh, is, is it naturally an environment of like distrust? Like when they come in, are you guys always kind of wary? Yeah, because you, you know they don't know what the fuck they're doing. Right. I mean, it's like, example. Lawrence Taylor, Bam Bam Bigelow. Right. Give me a break. And Bam did the job. You wouldn't 
Hell no. I take that back. Maybe they'll pay me. <laughs> I'm thinking about the WrestleMania money right now. <laughs> I'm thinking about the check. Maybe, maybe I would. But no, I mean, they trained the guy for a few weeks. Yeah. He go out there and lay down for him. But when you guys would get NFL, I'll take this example here for the Pittsburgh Steelers to come in. Do they come in respectful kind of understanding yeah. that you're athletes too? They do. Years ago, wrestling was that kind of the wink-wink joke by the sportscaster on the news. But now they're seeing the toll that you guys right. put on yourselves. So you got that respect yeah. in the locker room from NFL players. Yeah. And Was losing Mikey a big blow to the company? No. No. Were you surprised that WCW was interested in him at all? No. Why? Dude, they signed William Shatner. Fucking the dude from Star Trek to do a WWE pay-per-view. Don't shit surprise me in this business. Have anyone who left, all these guys that got signed for big money, was there anyone that you were really surprised Said, they fucking called him? No. Is there any surprise didn't get called? That you were like, how could they not want this guy? Because I've been in the business as long as I have, yeah. they don't, don't shit surprise me no more. I mean, it's like when they do it, they, they, I'm like, okay, it's something they see, don't nobody else see. What was the working relationship between ECW and FMW? They just gave you they, spots on their show? Yeah, that's all it was. Was it an increased pay? Because you're going over there working well, yeah, special of shows. Yeah. Um, had you wrestled prior in Japan? They did before once. ECW? I, I, I went one time. What did you think of Japan? I liked it. I what? loved <laughs> What about it? They love black people in Japan. Oh, really? Why, because you're a rarity? Yeah, man. I'm like, fuck yeah. They rub you to see if it comes you know, off like, like, that, hey, like that kid you told yeah. me. <laughs> what about the like, food, getting around and stuff? You're able to... Oh, man. It's, I mean, you know, they had... Or all the boys stay together, I yeah, guess. Yeah, they had people take us where we wanted to go, needed to go. Um... I think while you're over there, Sabu and Mibu have their uh, Japanese marriage ceremony. They're actually married back in 97, on June 22nd, 97 in Michigan, but they have a ceremony over there. Were you invited? No. To Sabu's Japanese wedding ceremony? Bastard. Is this your first on a pole match that you proposed? Could have been. Might have been. Could have been. It started a long trend. Um, it's been covered before, but it bears repeating. Um, what is it about the on the pole match? I know anyone in a box listen, is over right away. I know anyone in a box, listen, but we're at the pole. There haven't been a lot of on the pole matches because, listen, I challenge you right now. <laughs> Name three on the pole matches the, without that one. Viagra. Yes. Uh, Ju Judy. On a forklift, but I'll give uh, you that right, one. That's right. Okay. Um, okay. Well, what's that? Well, that, that was done way before me. Oh, tequila? I think it was, pinata. I think it was pinata, though, right? Yeah, pinata. Yeah. Pole. Okay, but that's, you know. No, that, that, see, those aren't even mine. You, but they're not mine. See, you, you, people remember specifically Viagra on a pole. Yes. Judy Bagwell on, on a forklift, forklift. but I'll, I'll give you the pole with that. And they remember Pinata on a pole. Yes. Those are the things they remember. So that equates to you did 5,000 pole matches. No, you remember three very specific pole matches because you're still talking about it 15 years later, but there were not 100 pole matches.
what's the eventual outcome? How does this all wrap up, this legal thing? I gotta quit it. So it goes to trial. Yeah. They come back with a verdict. Not guilty. Not guilty. Okay. They deliberated uh, like a day and a half. Who's covering legal fees for you? Is this Paul boy? Hayes. Okay. Is his company in any kind of liability for this, or is this solely you that's on trial? Actually, that was a question that came up in court when the DA said, he said to me, he said, you've been working for ECW for how long? And I said, I don't work for ECW. And he said, I was lying. So he pulled out these magazines that had me in it. He was ready in articles and shit. I said, I'm so contracted. Right. I said, I don't work for them. I said, I'm so contracted. I said, you look that up, see what it means. I don't work for them. And that shit went right out the window. Right. Paulie was like. Hey, Paulie must have blown you right on the, <laughs> right on the stand. He must have pulled it right out. Good for you, Paulie, Jack. Paulie looked, Paulie looked at me. It, it's almost like he wanted to say, if I would have known he was going to say that shit, <laughs> I would have dipped a long time ago. I like Carino. Paul Lee wasn't too crazy about him. Well, I was going to say, what were, the expe were there any expectations of him first coming in? I don't know. Or was this kind of like a tryout? But I, I, I think it was more than a tryout because he put him in some angles. You know what I mean? He didn't just, like, bring him in and say, okay, here's, here's a night. You know, go do a match. Now let me know. You know, I'll tell you how, what I think, whatever. He, he brought him in and he used him right, right off the bat. Did the strain, did Paulie not like him from the get-go, or was this I all think, the time? I, I think he kind of grew on him. So now we have Mexico. Japan coming in. Is Paulie just kind of pulling any card to try and spark something? Is it just agreements that he has with other territories? Why are people like this coming in? Well, for one, the ECW crowd, they were big Lucha fans. You know what I mean? Anything Mexico, anything Japanese, you know what I mean? They did like it. Don't, I don't know why, but they did. Well, let's talk about money again. We're at a time when things are tough. You've got to fly people in from right. Japan now, and so your expenses go up a little bit. Right. So you might say that that's incurring some extra expenses when you've already got trouble. Foolish? You could say that, yeah. Here's the thing, man, and this had a big, this was a big attitude spot, too, okay? I'll never forget, we have the Survivor Series, um, Brett punches Vince, right? Vince has a shiner, okay? I remember the next day at television. Now, keep in mind, it's, it's, th th this is like just a... The top guys are in this meeting. Okay, so it's me, it's Vince, it's Pritchard, it's Kevin Dunn. You know, Patterson would be there, Briscoe would be there, Lons would be there, all the agents would be there. Okay, there's probably eight people in this room. Okay, so Vince has a black eye. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the instinct of everybody in this room is to just bury this under the rug. Like Barry, you know, we, 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 we're not going to, you know, we're not going to tell publicly tell people what happened that, that, you know, Brett gave Vince a black eye, blah, 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 blah. You know, the instinct was to bury this, kayfabe this to everybody, right? So I remember I, I'm sitting in the room and I'm listening to all this. Cornette was probably in there too. Mm -hmm. I'm listening, was he? 
I think so. Yeah, I so I'm, I'm listening to all this, and I'm saying to myself, you, Bret Hart, just punched Vince McMahon in the face as a shoot, and we're going to sweep this under the rug? Because I'm thinking ratings, right? Right. So I'm listening, I'm listening, and then finally I said that. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? This is the biggest story perhaps in the history of wrestling, and we're going to sweep this under the rug. And, you know, I could tell everybody was quiet, like, you know, how dare Russo say that, but I could see Vince, and I could see, like, the wheels starting to turn a little bit. That turned into Vince didn't screw Brett, Brett screwed Brett promo, mm -hmm. which was a huge part and a huge piece of the Attitude Era. Were we all worked by Montreal? Is no. That possible? I, 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 I wish you were. I really do. Not many people know this. Um, when it was going down that day at Vince's house, it was Vince, it was um, me and Cornette. It was, the three of us were there, okay? I'll never forget, early on, Vince took me out of the room, and he says, Vince, he goes, Brett is supposed to call me today. He said, when Brett calls me, I want you to silently be the third party on the phone to be a witness. So when Vince had the conversation with Brett, I was on the phone without Brett knowing about it. I heard with my own two ears Vince pitch every possible scenario to Brett. Every scenario just to get the belt off Brett. And Brett poo-pooed one after the other after the other. I heard it. No, 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 no. So then we hang up the phone, we go back to the table, and I had just come off this conversation, right? And now it's getting late, and we'd been there all day. So now, like, I was a little pissed off because I heard Vince give Brett at least half a dozen options. So I remember, I, I said off the top of my head, Vin Vince, screw him. I said, have freaking Sean put him in the sharpshooter, have Sean put him in his own move, and have the referee call for the bell. Not, not, because I was pissed, you know, because I was like, Vince was really trying to work something out with Brett, and Brett, no, 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 no. So I went back to that table, I was like, freaking screw it. So like, literally right after that, it was late at night, we went home, okay? I did not see or hear from Vince for like the next two days, which was not the norm. Mm -hmm. Trust me, not the norm. So I have no idea what, what the, and I'm not going to ask him. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. that, uh, it's none of my business at this point. So I have no idea what the income, outcome is going to be. We get to the building that day. He's still avoiding me like the plague. You know, there's no communication. I, I, I'm taking care of what I have to take care of for the rest of the show. I'm not even involved in that. Sure enough, I mean, you know, the match comes. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what this, this is taking. I'm, I'm literally sitting next to Taker and watching this on the monitor, and I see Sean put him in the sharpshooter. And that's when you realize? Well, my first instinct was like, don't, no way. You know, I mean, really, I was like, no way. And then sure enough, the bell and blah, 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 and the rest was history. But the 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 Vince didn't screw Brett. Brett screwed Brett. That was huge for the Attitude Era because that was I mean that was real. That that was legitimate. Would Vince have gone along with their suggestion to sweep it under the rug had you not spoken up? I think so. Yeah, and I also want to say too, you know, just for the record, the Survivor Series took place on a um, on Sunday. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the this is the God honest truth, man. Um, Friday night, I'm home at my, my house, it's, it's, um, it's late at night, my phone rings. I pick up the phone, it's Owen Hart. Owen is hysterical, upset, crying, and he basically said to me, he said, Vince, he goes, Brett is threatening to disown me, 
not talk to me, not have anything to do with me the rest of his life if I go back to the WWE. You need to talk to him. So I was like, this was like way out of my place. <laughs> like I said, Owen, I said, it's not in my place to talk to Brett. You need to call Vince. And he goes, Vince, I tried to call Vince and I can't get a hold of him. You need to talk to Brett for me. I loved Owen to death. And the fact that he was like this upset, I felt that I had like no other choice. Yeah. And like, you know, Owen already told me I can't get a hold of Vince. So like I couldn't call Vince because if Owen couldn't get a hold of him, I wouldn't have been able to get a hold right. of him. I called Brett. This is, this is like the Friday after the Survivor Series. And I called Brett and, and, and I told him, man, it, it was one of the hardest phone. I swear to God, the two hardest things I think I ever had to do with wrestling was this conversation with Brett six days after and seeing Brett man to man, face to face the first time I went to WCW after Owen had passed away, okay? So I called Brett and I said to him, I said, I said Brett, I said, you're not gonna agree with this. I said, you're gonna hate me for it. You're gonna despise me for it. I said, but I have to be honest with you. I said, I would have done the same exact thing Vince did. And I explained to Brett, I said, I said, listen, it had nothing to do with Vince not trusting you. The issue was Medusa had just come off of dropping the woman's title in the garbage. Vince McMahon did not trust Eric Bischoff. I said all Vince was trying to do was protect his company and protect everybody in it. I said, so Brett, with all due respect, I said I would have done the same exact thing. And I mean, Brett said some things like in that conversation that like I, I, I won't repeat. But um, I, I wish, I wish all that was a work. And I mean, that's why pe people today like still talk about that as being a work. And I'm like, man, that was the, the, that was the hardest time for everybody. Said things to you that you wouldn't repeat, like cur curses, you mean? Or no, threats, no, no, or? Like, no, like, like, like what he felt like doing. Yeah, and he, I mean, he was, he, he was, he, he, he was just unrational. I mean, I could understand it. He was unrational at the time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, anybody that thinks that was a work, I mean, please. I, I remember the worst thing of that day for me and maybe my entire career was like n not knowing the facts. When that all went down, one of the first people I saw was Mick Foley, who I was very close to and still am to this day. And Mick looked at me. And he said to me, he said, Vince, you should be ashamed of yourself. And I mean that, like that broke my heart. But I, but I, why I, did he think automatically that you were behind it, and it wasn't a move that Vince pulled even behind your back? Well, I, well, I don't think he thought that I was behind it, but I think he thought, you know, being that it was a creative issue, I knew about it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Right. But like, it, it hurt me so much. But it was like, I knew the circumstances. I heard the conversation. You know, and right. Business people, you were all going to get contracts. Business people were going to run the business side. He was going to run. Does anybody buy it? No. Everybody knew the end of the, the, the deal was done. Were you offered a contract on paper? Yes. Yeah. At what point? Here or, or after this? It was around, it, it was right before I left. I left in, um, I think, 2000. Okay, so by, by this point, you still were just working on a handshake yeah. basis. Yeah. Was it something you would have wanted to do? Would you have wanted to get locked up like this? Because like you said, but Paulie said you're not going to work indies. So if you were exclusive to ECW, it would have limited your ability to make money elsewhere, don't you think? Well, I mean, it may, it may have limited it, but it, it was still a guarantee. You know what I mean? If I had to sign a contract to him, he would have had to pay me. And mine would have been more like I get paid every week whether we work or not. Mm -hmm. And that was my deal with him when I told him, I said, if you want me to stay at home, then you pay me. Right. And if he couldn't do it, then I wouldn't did it. Just incredible when we did the year 2000 with him. He said that even when people got contracts, he said literally some were written on napkins. So a contract yeah. with Paul for ECW. It didn't mean would, shit. Wouldn't, right. So 
What do you think, looking back at ECW, what do you think the legacy for that company is going to be? We talked about how maybe it's compared to WWF and WCW was kind of looked at as a minor league in a way. But long term, what do you think the legacy of ECW is going to be? I mean, it, we would leave the hardcore image always be there. You know, that's going to be there. That's, that's in stone, you know what I mean? And I mean, you know, that's, that's where a lot of the stuff was created from ECW. But there was great booking, great, yeah. great week to week stuff. Yeah. I, th I think gets lost by the blood and the guts. Right. But do you think you'll get, ECW would get its due? I mean, it clearly inspired what WWE did in the mid '90s and changing their whole right. And the attitude was ECW. Right. They used the scratch logo. You guys used barbed wire in the logo. Same shit. Right. Will you ever get that due? No. No. Is it important to you to get that? Not now. It meant something a long time. It, it, when, 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 when it was supposed to mean something, it meant something. But now it's just like it just got. It kind of like just got lost. It just got lost in the mix. You know what I mean? And it's just like you just accept what we did for what it was worth, and then just be done with it. Why do ECW fans still love the? I mean, the product. It was only a handful of years. Why are the fans so passionate about it now? Where you could have. Hardcore reunions and homecomings and all that, and people still turn out for because it as they, passionate as because they because they know what we did it was legit. We put on a show. It wasn't like start down here and build itself up. We came out the blocks running, full steam ahead. We put on a show. We sent you home with something to think about. I don't regret it, and I'll tell you why for a couple of reasons. First of all, th this, I always looked at this as a television show, uh, you know, because from 9 to 11 on Monday night, we are competing with other television shows. Stuff like this happens in other television shows all the time. It's not real. It's a show. It's entertainment. So I never had an issue with it. I get criticized a lot. This is what people don't understand. I get criticized a lot. People like to say to me that, well, you like to take credit for all the good stuff, but you don't take responsibility for any of the bad stuff. And what I try to logically explain to these people is, well, first of all, when you talk about I don't take responsibility for the bad stuff, that's subjective. Okay, you, you think it's the bad stuff, but what might be bad to you might not be bad for somebody else. So when you say, I don't take responsibility for the bad stuff, you're saying, I don't take responsibility for what you didn't like. I said, number two, obviously, if I didn't think it was a good idea, I wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. So like even stuff that played out that people didn't like, if I didn't think it was a good idea, I wouldn't have done it in the first place. So, of course, I'm not going to sit here and say, that was a bad idea, that was a bad idea, that was a bad idea, that was a bad idea. Because if, if, if I, I wouldn't have done it if I thought that. But you can look back through different eyes now after years have passed. Maybe the religion might play a little bit into it. Um, and look back and see that the sensitivities of a woman at home who maybe had experienced this, seeing it at a wrestling angle, 
Um, you might have thought it was tacky. Uh, you know what? Valid like, or not valid? I well, probably valid, but at the end of the day, listen, man, I'm a I'm a television junkie. I've been watching television my whole life. I'm a huge television fan. That that's my vice. And like I said, when you look at what's on from nine to eleven o'clock at night, this is this this is a storyline that you would have seen played out on, you know, dozens mm -hmm. of us. So that, so I, from from that perspective, I mean, now, there are things I did that I thought were bad, but I, I you know, this, I, I, that wasn't one of them. How soon after this happening does this come out that this actually happened? Is that, you could see that in the ratings, obviously, right? You could see a huge shift like that. Mm -hmm. When were you aware that it was Shivani that helped, that gave you the assist? But it wasn't, have you, have you ever talked to Tony about this? I haven't. Oh, well, I mean, Eric, in his headset, gave him that verbatim. Right, I mean, it's yeah, Tony's and, voice yeah, we Tony, hear. Because like, Tony was like, I mean, he, Tony knew when he said it, like, are you, are you serious? But um, just I mean just ju just a just a you I I, rem I remember watching it because I think we were taped or something. You were taped, we right? Were taped. Sure, that's because why I remember that's watching the, yeah, this, yeah. and I remember watching it and saying, "Listen, when, when you tell people don't turn the channel right there, they're going to turn the channel." Oh, so you knew immediately that this was going to backfire Absolutely. on them. Absolutely. The minute you tell somebody not to do something, they're going to do it, and then when you end it with the, probably one of the most beloved wrestlers in the history of, of the business finally getting his due, how are you not going to go change the channel and see that? Just, just really dumb. Did you think Mick was a good champion? Yeah, absolutely. And I think he deserved it. And I, 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 think, I think that's one of the things that, you know, throughout his illustrious career, he'll never forget. And I'm very thankful that we had the opportunity to do it. Well, I'm very thankful that you sat here for many hours. 88 pages me. we did, right? We did 89. 89. 89 pages. Nice. About 98. Looking back, a lot's happened to you with that company we just talked about since then and other companies. Where do you file 98 in your personal memories of your career as a whole? Uh, I mean, you know, like I said, I had never, I had never went back and watched any of this stuff. I mean, I was there the night that it happened, and that was the extent of it. Um, now, uh, due to my podcast, um, I'm going back and I'm watching this stuff and I'm commentating on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, watching this stuff compared to, you know, watching wrestling in 2015, I, I, I just sit there and I'm like, you know, you, you, you have to, you just have to be kidding me. I, I mean, it's, it's, the, the, the product today is mm -hmm. not even in the same ballpark. I remember, I, I just came off of one of the episodes, man, and it was the Tyson-Austin uh, first showdown in the ring. Remember when Tyson shoved sure. Austin and that yeah. violent point? Oh. I was watching that like, you know, and, and I realized it, just, it, it will never, ever get better than that. And like I said, man, I... I the, the talent we had, um, the best roster in the history of wrestling. I give Jim Ross all the credit for that. I, I worked for wrestling companies where the, 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 some of the athletes had no business, no business being on television, absolutely no business. And not only that, when their contracts were up, they would get re-signed. It was horrifying. The roster that Jim Ross you know, put together was just unbelievable. Everybody at the top of their game, there wasn't a weak link. But like I said, my, my proud moment is knowing how good these guys and gals were. Somebody had to give them the content every single week. And that's why I said, man, you know, Robert De Niro can make a blockbuster and he can make a bomb. You know, Dustin Hoffman can make The Graduate and, you know, he can make Hook. <laughs> you know, that's, that's all in the writing. So, so the challenge was, you know, from a writing level to be as good on our level as the performers were on theirs. And like I said, I look at today's product, 
What I'm seeing in the ring and what I'm seeing on the roster, there's no difference between that roster and the workers and the athletes today. There's absolutely no difference. They're busting their butts. Nobody's going through the motions. They're giving their all. The difference is they're not giving, they're not being given the material mm -hmm. that, that meets their talent. So you're getting their talent, but then you get material down here, and that's what it looks like, rather than the, the, the material being as good as their talent. That's the problem. That's what the, you, You're not getting that today. Yeah, I'd be remiss if I had you here and I didn't mention this. This, this is the height of the Attitude Era. This is the turnaround. This is after 83 weeks. Uh, you look back on it. You must have fond memories. There's so much to be proud of professionally for you. But is it like looking back at a marriage that became um, problematic later because you've got a lot of the people who benefited from these 89 pages in so many ways that are executives and owners of that company that shit all over you. Mm -hmm. Is it like looking through a scrapbook when you and your sweetheart, everything was great and wondering, what did I do but give you success yeah no of course it is because you know I, I i can't help but to look at listen people don't understand this when, when i started writing the television first of all vince mcmahon was in a the, the, vince mcmahon the wwe was in such a bad place at that time the company was financially in the red they were in such a bad place at the time that he gave a magazine writer the job of writing television that's almost like i have nothing to lose like i i have i i had never written tv before you know i, I was the editor of the magazine mm -hmm. that kind of shows you like the state of desperation like I, I i don't know this is crazy enough to work so it, it's like you know i sit here and and i so i look at where they were prior to vince russo working on the television. The, the, the success while Vince Russo was there, and then a, a, a 15 year drop in the ratings after Vince Russo left. And like, I just, I, 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 I can't put myself on the same level of, do you really have that much of an ego that you cannot give somebody else credit for part of the success that your company had. I, I'm the kind of guy, like, that's why every interview I do, you, you know, you can hear me, you can go back and look. I, I can't mention Ed Ferrara enough. To me, it brings me great joy to put other people over. It gives me great joy to say J Jim Ross put together a great roster. It gives me great joy to say Vince Russo was able, uh, Vince McMahon took those nuances and made everything better. Everybody on the roster was at the top of the game. Richie Curtis, it, it, it brings me great joy to put other people over. Why can't that building? But th that's they I, put everybody over. They that's, put Hogan that's over. That's what I'm saying. I, I can't comprehend in my mind, you're, you're going to bring on a guy in Eric Bischoff who, whose goal was to put your company out of business, who challenged you to a shoot fight, by the way, who used Ted Turner's money to buy everybody, uh, you know, you know, from your company, you're going to take your time and resources to put that guy over and use him to discredit the guy that was a big part of giving you the greatest, you know, era in wrestling history. I, 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 I can't make sense. I can't. Listen, if Vince McMahon has that type of an ego, I can't comprehend that type of an ego. I can't understand it because I don't have it. I love talking about the Attitude Era because everybody involved in this should be proud of it, but I also love putting everybody over and, you know, you know talking about, you know, a Shawn Michaels, you know, and, and, and the stuff that he did. That brings joy to me. Why he wants to go the other way, I mean, I just, I, I can't understand the, an ego that big. And, and, and it really is bittersweet because, you know, I'm, I'm a big baseball fan. And... Um, how many times you, know, you could watch any team, you know, how many times does the, uh, does the old timer come up in the booth 
and mm -hmm. sit in the booth and the announcers are like, you know, Willie Mays is here. Not that I'm Willie Mays by any stretch of the imagination, but you, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the people that were a rich part of, of, the, of the history of the team, you know, they're welcome to the stadium. And, and for me to just like, it, it's almost like, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's a mission to discredit anything Vince did. I just, I, I can't understand. Is it just because you left? Is it just because you left? No, because a lot of people left and came back. But I left and, and I did go back. And, and I also apologized to Vince for leaving the way I did and told him man to man, face to face, this is why I did it. This is why I, I explained it to him man to man, face to face, this is why I did it. You know, the comment he made about getting a nanny to raise my kids, I, I hit him with, I told him I did not appreciate that. So, like, I would have thought in 2002 that that meeting was mm -hmm. water under the bridge. But I, I don't know, man. I, I, I think they need to worry a little bit more about their product than they do me. Thank you for taking the journey, Willie Mays. The Willie Mays of wrestling. No, please job. don't even say, no, no, cut that, edit that. <laughs> He's going to run with it. Cor Corny's going to run with it. No. Thank you for watching. Corny won't run with that. He don't know who Willie Mays is. <laughs>